All right, welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie Bedinsky, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's Salvation Debate. It is a privilege to have pastors Jeff Dollar and Tommy McMurtry to debate Perseverance of the Saints versus Once Saved, Always Saved. Pastor Jeff taking the Perseverance of the Saints view and Pastor Tommy taking the once saved, always saved position. Gentlemen, before we get into opening statements and the debate itself, what I'd like to do is get acquainted a little bit, kind of break the ice and get to know you gentlemen. Pastor Jeff, it is your first time here on the Standing for Truth debate platform. So firstly, I appreciate you giving us your time. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and also your ministry? Well, yes. Uh, thanks for having me on, Donnie. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm uh, a former fundamentalist. I was uh, started out life as a Roman Catholic and was converted around the age of 16 in a fundamental Baptist church, went to Hiles Anderson College for about five years, then uh, finished at Manahath School of Theology and been in various churches. Uh, I was an elder in the PCA for a couple of years, and now I pastor an independent reform church, community Bible church in Portage, Pennsylvania. Okay, very good. I appreciate it, uh, Pastor Jeff. For anybody that wants to see more from you, I do have your channel linked in the description box for, for people to check out. So again, thanks for being here. Pastor Tommy, certainly not your first time here on the Standing for Truth debate platform. How you been since the last time you were here? And also a little bit about yourself and your church. Yeah, doing really good. Um, had Just had a nice trip to Philly since uh, last week uh, when I did the discussion uh, on here and everything's been going good and uh, excited to be having this conversation. Um, me and Pastor Dollar, we go way back. We've been fighting with each other for years and um, I'm all psyched up for this. I uh, literally, before we got on, I listened to Jack Smack's uh, Calvinists are not saved song and it got me fired up and raring to go now. <laughs> well, here we go. This is going to be an epic soteriology showdown. Sounds like it's a debate that's been in the works or making for quite a few years. So I'm excited to see what you're both going to bring to the table for tonight. If I'm not mistaken, both of you hold eternal security, but different viewpoints or understandings of eternal security. And so I think this is going to be a really uh, interesting, thought-provoking and edifying debate. I'm not sure if I've seen a ton specifically on just perseverance of the saints versus once saved, always saved. So I think this is going to be good. And allow me to go over the format for the audience's sake. And so we're going to be having 15-minute opening statements for our guests to lay out their positions and arguments for tonight. Then we're going to have uninterrupted rebuttals. So rebuttals will be eight minutes. Pastor Jeff and Pastor Tommy can address each other's opening statements during that uh, portion. Then we're going to have a 40-minute discussion. Rather than a real strict just Q&A cross-exam, it's going to be 20 minutes each where they uh, can pick the topics and kind of lead the way in discussion. Then we'll have a five-minute closing statement. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. As always, we're going to have about a 25 to 30-minute audience Q&A. So please, if you do have a question, let's keep it on topic. Tag me if you can, at Donnie or at Standing for Truth, and then let me know who the question's for. And with that, we're going to get right into our first opening statement, which goes to Pastor Tommy McMurtry. Tommy, you have 15 minutes whenever you're ready, and the floor is yours. Go ahead. All right. Well, yeah, I'm really excited. I think this is an important discussion. Uh, there was a documentary that came out recently called Once Saved, Always Saved, and it was clearly addressing, I believe, the Calvinist version of it. And many people who are opposed to once saved, always saved are typically people who are strongly opposed to Calvinism. And I believe that you can believe in once saved, always saved without it believing any of the tulip. And so hopefully we will uh, clearly illustrate the differences tonight. And so when it comes to this subject, uh, perseverance of the saints versus once saved, always saved, I do believe there are distinct differences that we could point uh, to, to those who hold these positions. And whether it's fair or unfair, the simple fact is we're going to get lumped into a group when we accept a doctrinal position. And so while there's always exceptions to everything, I hope to point out tonight some clear differences 
uh, that you will commonly find in people who hold to perseverance of the saints or uh, once saved, always saved. Because we're both in agreement that one cannot go from saved to unsaved. But we both come to that same conclusion in very different ways. And we interpret many scriptures in very different ways. My goal tonight is to represent perseverance of the saints in a way that Pastor Dollar would agree is fair, but then hopefully convince the audience it is a false doctrine. I hope to do this by showing in a biblical way proof that one cannot go from saved to unsaved, but also show uh, the many misuses of scripture that typically come from the Calvinists. And so one of the things that's, I believe, dangerous about your typical Calvinist they are often very good at eloquently proclaiming a great truth. They have many good writings. They have many great quotes from great orators such as Spurgeon and others. But what often happens, though, is they'll read a great quote or they'll read a very beautifully worded confession or doctrinal statement that often isn't as specific as it should be. This enables the Calvinists to align themselves with the person making the great quote or the beautifully worded, although vague, confession and then proceed to expound to us a great error from their own words. And I believe that the Calvinist version of perseverance of the saints, or the way your typical Calvinist would teach perseverance of the saints, not only has clear errors that I hope to display, but I believe causes a lot of confusion. I believe it makes it so one cannot possibly know that they have eternal life. So if I may briefly explain what I believe the differences are between these two, two teachings. Perseverance of the saints, I believe, teaches assurance of salvation, not the obtaining of salvation, but uh, the assurance of salvation on the works of the believer or saint, while once saved, always saved, teaches assurance of salvation based on the works of Christ. Perseverance of the saints, they will give credit for the works uh, that the believer does to Christ or the Holy Spirit, but they still focus on the works of the believer or the saint. Hence, perseverance of the saints. All who teach perseverance of the saints, I believe, have to, of nece by necessity, lower God's standard of righteousness. I believe they're incapable of giving a clear definition of what standard one needs to live up to to prove to themselves or anyone that they're saved. Once saved, always saved though, has a crystal clear definition of righteousness that does not move or change just as God does not change. The standard is full and total obedience to God's word. And the only way we can do that is if we receive imputed righteousness because Jesus had full and total obedience. Any good works that come from us are just works, uh, or after we get saved, any good works, these are works done under grace rather than the law of Moses. Perseverance of the saints, uh, those the teachers of that, have an extremely vague and unclear teaching also on the doctrine of repentance that in reality teaches only a partial or selective repentance. I don't think any Calvinists would claim that they have forsaken all of their sins and have no sin, but yet at the same time, if somebody still has too many sins in their life, well, then they failed to have true repentance. So to me, that's only a partial repentance if they still have sin in their life. Once saved, always saved, though, has a crystal clear definition of repentance that causes one to fully understand their only hope of salvation is to call on the name of the Lord, believe on Christ. Perseverance of the saints, I believe, teaches an embarrassingly shameful view of sanctification that causes them to reject the profession of someone simply because their filthy rags are slightly dirtier than their own personal filthy rags. All these things I'm saying, I, I'm sure will be rejected by Pastor Dollar, but you're going to have to be the judge of what I'm saying tonight is I'm sure he's going to have to focus a lot of attention on the saint rather than the savior because of my own personal, you know, so when it comes to you know, me personally, and like I, I mentioned, me and Pastor Dollar, we go way back, but you know, I don't, I don't hate Pastor Dollar. I, I kind of like him as a human being. I think he's a likable person. Uh, when it comes to his personal behavior, I don't really have a problem with him. Uh, I've always enjoyed uh, the shooting back and forth that we've done over the years, but I have no desire to make any kind of personal attack on him tonight. But I must say, when it comes to the doctrine of Calvinism, I must be honest, 
And he does hold to this. And I believe when we measure up what he teaches with the scripture, one must conclude that Pastor Dollar, as well as all Calvinists, have embraced a modern day or a repackaged form of the doctrine of the Pharisees. And when I look at the teaching of Calvinists, I believe they embody the spirit of Pharisees that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 23, verses 24 through 28, when he said, ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And I think anyone who teaches that they repented of all their sins and they are persevering because of their works, I believe is a hypocrite. And this brings me to another clear distinction between those who hold to perseverance of the saints versus once saved, always saved. The perseverance of the saints believer constantly quotes dead guys, while once saved, always saved believers, they constantly quote scripture. So this is one more area where they're like the Pharisee. They put tradition over scripture. They're always wanting to align themselves with these famous, well-liked historical figures. But if I may take a few minutes, though, to give a definition of perseverance of the saints and then show my problems with it, and then I'll give my definition of once saved, always saved. But this is from the Westminster Confession that I do believe uh, Pastor Dollar uh, holds to, if I'm not mistaken. But it says on perseverance of the saints, they whom God hath accepted in his beloved, effectually called um, and sanctified by his spirit, can neither totally nor finally fall away from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. Um, and we don't have time to discuss my thoughts on the effectual call. But with the exception of those two words, I don't really have a problem with what I just read there. The second section says this perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father upon the efficacy and of the merit and intercession of Jesus Christ, the abiding of the Spirit and the seed of God within them, and nature of the covenant of grace from all which ariseth also certain and certainly an infallibility thereof. I think this is also pretty good, even though I know Pastor Don and I would disagree on things concerning free will and also election. But if free will and election are defined properly, I really don't have a problem with this, this section. Third section, nevertheless, they may, through the temptations of Satan and of the world, the prevalency of corruption remain in them and neglect the means of their preservation, fall into grievous sins, and for a time continue therein, whereby they incur God's displeasure and grieve his Holy Spirit come to be deprived of some measure of their graces and comforts, have their hearts hardened and their conscience wounded, hurt and scandalize others and bring temporal judgments upon themselves. Now, again, this is pretty good, but I have two problems with the statement. One, it's too vague, making it so any Calvinist can come along and set whatever standard they want about how much sin someone can get into or how much time someone can spend in sin to where, uh, you know, and you can't get any two Calvinists to agree on just how much sin a saved person can go into or how long they can stay in there. There's no clear definition of what it means to persevere. Does this mean, you know, I'll never cuss again? I, I doubt they'd say that. But does it mean then I'll never become a sodomite? Where do we draw the line? I, I can't figure that out. Maybe we'll get some clarification on that tonight. But my second problem is the whole concept because it's called the perseverance of the saints when it should be called the perseverance of the Holy Spirit or Jesus Christ. And I can promise you tonight that if you're looking for assurance of salvation, if you find assurance through Pastor Dollar's doctrine, your assurance will be in yourself. But if you listen to what I'm going to teach tonight, your assurance will be in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 6, 17, wherein God will willing more abundantly to show into the heirs of the promise of the immutability of his counsel confirmed by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge. 
to take hold of, upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All who are saved were nothing but just helpless sinners who fled to Jesus for refuge because we we're too sinful. We had no hope on our own. Once saved, always saved, teaches the perseverance of the Holy Spirit or Jesus. I'm saved because Jesus persevered to the end and he endured the cross. I stay saved because the Holy Spirit keeps me saved. And while this teaching is very simple, it is very biblical, but what Calvinists do, they like to cast doubt on it. They give us hypotheticals. And I'm sure we'll hear all kinds of possible scenarios tonight, like what about someone who just prays a prayer and then goes on to massacre all the puppies in the animal shelter? This is their way of bringing shame to the Savior by being an accuser of the brethren. Again, they can't give the clear definition of perseverance. They just try to make up scenarios that they know would shame the Holy Spirit who seals us. But here's the problem with this. Like all false salvation teaching, it doesn't factor in the Holy Spirit. It also assumes it knows exactly how the Holy Spirit will act and when it will act. We can't know that. This is nothing more than a distraction to cast doubt on people's salvation. I think it's shameful. I believe Christians should stand against it 100%. And I can have some mercy for many people in the past who've held to some form of Calvinism. After all, you know, there was a time when getting your hands on a Bible was difficult. There was a time when the Catholic Church had a stranglehold on many, and especially the religious leaders. I'm thankful for those who saw errors in the Catholic Church and came out of it, but we shouldn't be surprised that they came out with some doctrinal baggage. I'm not here today to throw all who have ever been considered Calvinists in history into hell, but I'm I am here today to say we have no excuse for this horrible doctrine anymore. Just like our nation has some things in its history that we are now ashamed of, like slavery, many churches have things in their history they should be ashamed of. And I believe Calvinism is one of those things. And someone trying to introduce Calvinism in their churches today should be viewed the same way we would view someone coming into Congress today trying to introduce owning slaves. I think, I think we're past that. And I think we should be past focusing specifically on the works of the believer, the perseverance of the of, of the saints, and get back to keeping the focus on Jesus Christ. And if I may quote a Calvinist, R.C. Sproul, uh, Sproul, he said, this brings us to the P and Tulip. I'm sure you'd be allowed to know that I'm not going to change this letter. The letter stands for perseverance of the saints. However, even though I'm not changing the letter, I'm going to change the word. I like the catchphrase, perseverance of the saints. Is, uh, but I believe even that is dangerously misleading because it suggests, again, that persevering is something we do. And I, I personally... One minute. Okay. And so I do. I believe, and he's, he goes on to say, I believe, of course, that saints do persevere in faith. Uh, I, I believe that and that those who have been effectually called and reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit endure to the end. They do persevere, but not simply because they are so diligent in making use of their mercies of God. The only reason we can give for why we continue in the faith until the last day is not because we have preserved so, or persevered so much, but because we have been preserved. But again, even with Sproul, he's focusing on our works, and I don't believe that's supposed to be done in salvation. So hopefully... Um, that helps you understand where I believe the differences are. Okay, thank you very much, Pastor Tommy McMurtry, for that 15-minute opening statement. It's great to see how engaged our audience is tonight in the live chat. Looks like we got a solid mix of views tonight. And uh, questions are already flying in. I will let the audience know that I am all caught up, and I do appreciate it. Pastor Jeff Dollar, we're now going to hand it to you. Allow me to restart the timer, and you have... 15 minutes for an opening statement. Go ahead. Okay. First of all, I'd like to thank Tommy for giving that reading of the Westminster Confession. It does save me a little bit of time. Uh, and also that the feeling is mutual. Um, we go to the mattresses, but I have no personal animosity, although uh, things might get a little rough as we go along today. Uh, the perseverance of the saints, uh, which is summed up in my church's doctrinal statement, the Westminster Confession. Uh, it does give us the definition. I think that was a good definition. In other words, 
People who are called to be saints and called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28, will continue believing in Jesus Christ, struggling with sin, and striving to obey the word of God the rest of their lives. They may falter on occasion and need to be restored, as we find with Peter, but will never finally fall into apostasy. Uh, one might ask how this differs from the doctrine of once saved, always saved. I think Tommy gave a, 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 a pretty good uh, explanation, but the problem with this in a debate like this, uh, the challenge lies in the difference in defining once saved, always saved among fundamentalists. It means one thing to an old school fundamentalist like Lester Roloff and something different to those who are in the Jack Hiles, Curtis Hudson branch of fundamentalism. Uh, there would not be a whole lot of difference between, in practice, between my position and Lester Roloff's position. Uh, if you didn't know the theology that separates us, what we teach about eternal security would be very similar. Uh, so if you're tuning in to hear the finer points of difference between the old school fundamentalism and the Calvinistic doctrine of, uh, of perseverance of the saints, you're going to be disappointed. I don't believe that Tommy holds that position. Also, uh, his position, he tends to uh, use a couple of, of terms which I would say not irritate me, but concern me, uh, that to, to use the term perseverance of the saints or anything Calvinistic uh, is, used, is sometimes called another gospel. Uh, one And his version is one way of determining whether or not a person is saved or not is to find out if they believe in eternal security. In other words, if a person believes in losing their salvation or they don't hold to his particular position, it may constitute a work salvation. Uh, he has stated that the perseverance of the saints is a false doctrine and a damnable heresy, and it is arrogant to believe it. Now, so these are rather strong words. Now, these can all be gleaned from Tommy's sermons and videos. So how are we to approach this? Uh, the position that Tommy espouses, as far as I can tell, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, is a hybrid product of the so-called free grace movement and the old school fundamentalism. Uh, our debate tonight will focus probably more on the Hiles version, which I believe infiltrated fundamentalism during the lordship controversy of the 80s and 90s. And with that brought a cheapening of the concept of what it means to be a Christian. So let me first lay out my position and to dispel any misconceptions and straw men that had been promoted by some in the uh, once saved, always saved side. Uh, first, I believe wholeheartedly that once a person's faith is placed in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are saved forever. There is no possibility that that person could ever be lost. Salvation is instantaneous upon faith and eternal and anchored on the person and work of Jesus Christ alone. I am saved through his work on the cross and his righteousness placed on my account alone. That being the case, secondly, I believe that there is no room for works whatsoever in the salvation of a soul. You can't work to obtain it and you don't work to keep it. I deny altogether the Arminian position of maintaining good works as a, mean of keep, a means of keeping the gift of eternal life. The accusation that perseverance is a backdoor to work salvation is simply ludicrous as I hope to demonstrate during the course of this debate. I contribute nothing to my salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Uh, thirdly, I believe that a Christian can know for certain that they have eternal life. This is not based on their own efforts or accomplishments, but on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within them. And Tommy and I agree on this, but it's how it's expressed, I think, is where we'll find the difference. As Paul says in his letter, letter to the Philippians, believers are commanded to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. How is this possible? Well, because or for it is God who works in you both to do and or both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So please note the debate tonight should focus on what is the basis for this assurance. Is it something I have done in the past or is it the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in the life? To understand the perseverance position, one must first understand the foundation behind it. The condition of man requires a supernatural work of God to be saved. Salvation is just as miraculous as raising one from the dead, for that's what it is. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. By nature, man is a slave to sin. 
incapable of doing or even understanding the spiritual things of God, not hungering for God or seeking after him. In the theology I espouse, by the time you get to the perseverance of the saints, you have already seen that God the Father, in mercy, takes the initiative of choosing out of the fallen and condemned human race a people for his own. Romans 8, Ephesians 1, 2 Thessalonians 2, etc. He then gives these people to the Son for their redemption, John 6 and, and 17, cleansing them from sin and providing them the righteousness they lack, Romans 4 through 5, etc. We see this in 1 Peter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit completes that work by applying the work of the Son in justification and sanctification, Titus 3, 5. So the keeping of my salvation depends upon the foundation already laid by all three members of the Holy Trinity. That being the case, it is an impenetrable fortress guarded by God himself. No man can pluck me out of his hand, John 10, and nothing shall be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, Romans 8. Not because I'm obeying, but because God is preserving. The argument here is how God preserves and how I can know it. The foundation of the perseverance doctrine is found in the new covenant made with God's people, which centers upon the new birth. As such, the good works that must of necessity proceed from the Christian, Ephesians 2.10 and Titus 2.14, are not something they must or can produce of their own strength. They must be there, but they are there because of the work of God. The Lord Jesus Christ in John 3 spoke to Nicodemus regarding the necessity of the new birth. He confronted Nicodemus with his ignorance about this when he asked, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? In other words, as the premier teacher of Israel, Nicodemus should have understood that Jesus, what Jesus was referring to, but he didn't. The answer to Nicodemus' mystery is found in Ezekiel 36, verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Notice the cause. What is the cause? God himself. As such, the good works that must of necessity proceed from the Christian are not something they must or can produce of their own strength. They must be there, but they are there because of the work of God. So what are we to think about these good works? They cannot save, but they are important because they serve as an evidence of the unseen faith that exists within. They will of necessity proceed from the born-again believer, having a new heart and spirit put there by God, they will then, in the power of God, walk in God's statutes and keep his judgments, not because they are proving they are saved or keeping themselves saved, but because God empowers them to do, do so as the scriptures say. So what of keeping the faith? Is it possible that a Christian would, will wake up one morning and no longer believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, Jeremiah, in explaining the new covenant, says the same thing. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. This is Isaiah 32, verse 40. And I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts. Notice this, so that they will not depart from me. God has done this. Now, Tommy uh, made the statement in the past. He doesn't know if he'll keep the faith in the future. And if anyone says that they uh, think that they will, that, that is arrogant. But that would be true if you're trusting in yourself. But if the word of God gives us the faith so that we will not depart from him, that's a whole nother story. So when Paul commands us to examine ourselves, whether we are in the faith, and Peter commands us to make our calling and election sure, just how are we to do that? Now, according to Tommy, and once again, I'm, I'm just quoting from some of his old videos, uh, he may change his mind. It is not the works proceeding from the believer, but the profession that is important. In his video on tearing up the tulip on perseverance, he states it is he does not use the change of life as something to judge another person's salvation, quoting, I am going to judge whether or not they're saved based on their profession. So the difference 
is that in Tommy's position, I can know 100% for sure I'm saved by a one-time act of faith and repentance. This profession is so important that some preachers of his theological persuasion have admitted to making several professions of faith over time just to make sure they did it right. The problem with making your profession the evidence of your salvation is that it requires faith in something you have done. And it deals with the sincerity of what, what's going on behind it. While, while it's going on, do I really mean it? Were my motives right? My first profession of faith was as a child well over 50 years ago, and memories fade. Trusting in a profession or a prayer is not much different from the Roman Catholic who trusts in the Our Fathers and Hail Marys. A person uh, not only initially professes faith in Christ, but continues that profession the rest of their lives. A person not only calls on the name of the Lord initially to be saved, but they continue calling on him for the rest of their lives. We can look at the fruit of our lives and determine if there is evidence of the presence and work of the Holy Spirit. I can examine what is proceeding from my heart and life. Do I have a new heart? Ezekiel 11 and Ezekiel 36. Am I walking in the commands of Christ? John 14, 15. Do I hunger and thirst after righteousness? Matthew chapter 5, verse 6. Do I have a new spirit within me? Romans 8, 16, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Is the Holy Spirit convincing me of sin, righteousness, and judgment? John 16. Do I love the Lord Jesus Christ? John 8, 42, Ephesians 6, 24. Do I love the word of God? Psalm 119, 97. Do I love the people of God? 1 John 2, 10. There's also the negative side that I am to be warned about. If I examine my life and find that I am given over to the love of sin and the pursuit of evil, if my life is characterized by unrighteousness, fornication, or homosexuality, or if I continue to walk in the way of the Gentiles and lewdness and lying and so forth, then I have no guarantee of inheriting the kingdom of God. There are multiple warnings of this, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5. Uh, now, Tommy may make the statement that such is not the case, that a person may continue pursuing sin and go to heaven, but Paul warns us not to be deceived by such empty words, Ephesians 5, 6. This here is the key to the whole discussion. Tommy agrees that the Holy Spirit is present with the believer at salvation and is the reason the believer cannot lose their salvation. He pointed this out in his debate with A.K. Richardson last week. The question is, if the Spirit is indeed present in the believer, and their actual physical body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, what exactly does that mean? Will there be any tangible evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit? We are told that the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, Romans 8, 16. How does he do that? He does that by bringing the life of God into the soul of man, fulfilling the promises of the new covenant and leading the believer in holiness, which we are commanded to pursue and without which we cannot see God. When he enters, uh, there will be a newfound hatred of sin and an ongoing battle against it, as we find in Romans 7. The Holy Spirit will bring with him the fruit of the Spirit as found in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness. One faith, minute left. And begin working them out in the life of the believer. He will go to war against the works of the flesh. And the rest of the life will be spent in repentance, battling these sins. Why? Because you cannot have the third person of the Trinity taking up residence in your body and not see some sort of reaction. He is not going to find some abandoned corner of the heart and remain silent for the entire lifetime of the believer and allow all, all sorts of evil to reign. There is a reason that Paul says in Ephesians 2, that having been saved by grace through faith, the believers are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It, it, is it a profession of faith or is it something more? We can rest assured we will remain in the faith for the rest of our lives. And we can know for certain that this faith is genuine. Jude 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. Okay, Pastor Jeff Dollar, thank you very much for that 15-minute opening statement. Gentlemen, that concludes our opening statements for tonight's debate.
I appreciate the uh, time and work you both put into those. We got uh, some excellent points on the table to engage. And so we're moving into our rebuttal phase now. And so for rebuttals, we have eight minutes on the clock, uninterrupted rebuttals, that is. And so, Pastor Tommy, we will now hand it back to you for an eight-minute response. Go ahead. Yeah, so he, um, I like that he met, he brought up the old battle of lordship salvation versus easy believism. You know, he dropped names like Lester Roloff, Jack Hiles, Curtis Hudson. And um, I think it's important to be aware of those things because often movements, uh, they do, they kind of create fringe ideas. You know, a false doctrine will become big and then people will sometimes maybe move too far away from it and go into other heresy. And so um, often too, I personally think if you look at the words of Jack Hiles and the words of men like Curtis Hudson, I believe they were right on the money. Now, there are people who have aligned themselves with them that, yeah, they took things too far and are, you know, just getting massive groups of people to repeat a prayer when they've not checked with them on even what they believe. And um, yeah, and it makes our side look bad. A lot of the free grace community, I believe, makes once saved, always saved look bad. But at the end of the day, I try to pay very close attention to their words. And I think it's very important that we are saying the right things. I think our behavior is also very important. But we do need, because of all these different movements and people maybe swinging the pendulum too far, definitions often change in how people use words over time. And this is why we must ask clarifying questions. And this is why, this is why too, I think it's better for me and Pastor Dollar to come and talk about these things rather than just make videos about what each other are actually saying. I think this, I think this kind of thing is valuable. And so, uh, you know, he asked, you know, he talked about how a Christian will know, you know, but again, how, you know, I specifically, you know, how many works do I need to see? Uh, you know, he mentioned uh, providing uh, how uh, God will provide the righteousness they lack. Okay. So, you know, he said the works must be there. But if that's just, if God just changed me from, let's say, a drunk and a drug addict to just a Baptist preacher, well, I, my righteousness is still as filthy rags. A ba Baptist preacher who's been doing all these good works and has never realized that he is a sinner worthy of hell and has put his faith and trust in Christ for salvation, even Pastor Dollar would agree that he's going to go to hell. So, I mean, that's it's not like the nature of God to do a change and it not be complete. And we are very incomplete right now. Because the new birth, it was a spiritual birth. We have the spiritual man, the new man. And this perseverance of the saints, it's putting too much focus on the old man that's going to die. It's going to go to the grave. And one of these days, God is going to regenerate this vile body. And he's going to make it like Christ. Because when God changes something, he changes it all the way. And so the change that took place in me, it was, it was a spiritual play. It was a spiritual change, but the old man is still alive and well. And so, uh, he mentioned, uh, one of my comments about keeping the faith. I'm going to keep, uh, always keep the faith. Well, I believe I will always believe on Christ, but keeping the faith is more than just believing on Christ. Uh, we see in first Timothy five, eight, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Um, it, if we're, you're not providing for your family, you're not keeping the faith. Keeping the faith is not just getting saved and continuing to believe Jesus died, and buried, and rose again for you. It's about living like a Christian. It's about being obedient to, to his word. And we should uh, all be aware of the fact that we're capable, because of our old man, of getting in really big trouble. And we ought to take heed lest we fall. Again, not from our salvation, but we can fall away from just being obedient to God and being used of God and being fruitful. So I'm very capable of that. I, I don't know for sure. I will always be a Baptist preacher. I could go liberal. I could turn into a Calvinist. I don't know. I, I hope not. I don't think I will. I'm not planning on it, but uh, I don't trust him. I don't trust myself. My old man is too sinful. And so he brought up the multiple professions thing, and um, I, I know what he's referring to. Um, that's kind of a weird thing. 
But under, I do believe many people, after they get saved, sometimes might pray again because they get confused. Sometimes people get confused because of bad teaching. And I, you know, even when I was younger, I went through a period of time where I was wondering, did I really get it? Because I didn't have this miraculous transformation that took place at five years old. But at the same time, I did finally come to a point in my life where I got full assurance of my salvation. And I believe many people have prayed multiple prayers, but and they eventually got full sal or full assurance of their salvation, but they got saved at the first profession if they believed. And so, um, you know, the you know he mentions the fruit that you're going to have, and uh, maybe at some point we can talk. We'll pr probably get to this, but I do think Calvinists often mistakenly call the fruit of the Spirit. They they look at it as fruit of having the Holy Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit it's not the fruit of having the Holy Spirit. It's the fruit of walking in the spirit. And we and Paul had to command them to walk in the spirit so they would not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the works of the spirit are love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. If you're walking in the spirit, the spirit, you will not break any law of God. But if you walk in the flesh, the works of the flesh are manifest. How do I know if somebody is walking in the flesh? Well, they're going to do all those bad things that I mentioned. And we see examples in the Bible of saved people doing some of those very things. And um, and so uh, I do believe a saved person is capable of getting drunk, uh, but I don't believe they lose their salvation because of it. And so, you know, will there be evidence of the Holy Spirit? And let me just say this. I believe there will be, but I refuse to try to define it. You know why? Because I don't know how the Holy Spirit's going to work. I don't know the timing in which he is going to work. There is such a thing as false professions. There is such a thing as people who creep in. Satan sows tares among the wheat. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change the fact the gospel is very simple. No works are required. And the Bible doesn't use the works of man as proof of salvation. It uses the works of Jesus Christ. He is the just. And the justifier. Now, as a individual, as a pastor of a church, sometimes we might have to look at somebody and say, hey, they are not displaying any evidence of having the Holy Spirit. And we might have to put them out of the church. In Matthew 18, 17, it says, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Doesn't say he is a heathen, but sometimes you might have to treat someone like that. And they might be. 30 and, I, and there's a lot of free grace people out there that I wouldn't let in my church. You know why? Because they behave like a heathen. You saying they're not saved? Well, not based on their words, but based on their works. I might not think that they are saved, but they're not standing before me on judgment day. And I refuse to set that standard of because I don't know what it is. And I don't know what the Holy Spirit will do because I am not the Holy Spirit. And so I think uh, Calvinists try too hard and think they know too well what exactly the Holy Spirit will do. And I think it's confusing. Thank you, Tommy, for that eight minute uninterrupted rebuttal. Uh, Jeff, we're now going to hand it back to you. And you also have eight minutes. I'll start the timer on your first word. Go ahead. Okay, let me set my own timer here. I actually forgot all about this. Just uh, give me a second. Okay, no problem. Old guys in technology don't get along very well. I apologize. <laughs> no worries. Take your time. I'll let the audience know that I am all caught up on questions. And so if you do have a question for uh, Pastor Jeff or Pastor Tommy, feel free to send them in. Send me in some specific passages that you'd like to see them engage as well. We'll have some fun with that. Okay, Pastor Jeff. Okay, I, I'm ready now. Okay. okay. Uh, first, I'd like to just say I, I agree with Tommy on the issue of church discipline. Uh, the, but the church discipline is there for a purpose. That is that if a person, say, is having a relationship with with a with their stepmother, as we find in First Corinthians uh, five, I think it is that that individual is then removed from the church for a reason. Uh, that reason is we don't recognize you as a Christian under the current situation. I can't read the heart. Nobody can look at the heart, but we can see from the outside 
uh, behavior that that person is in deep sin. So that being the case, we we enact church discipline. And one of the the things of church discipline that is done is to bar that person from the Lord's table, at least in, in our church is what what we would do. Uh, that reason is because under this under the way that you're behaving, we can't accept you as a Christian. They repent, they turn uh, away from what they're doing, and uh, come to the church. We receive them back in. So uh, that's uh, I think that was I don't know if we how much we agree on that, but I, I'm glad that Tommy Tommy brought that up. He mentioned that that uh, in his opening statement about the once saved always saved documentary. Uh, I would agree with him on that. Uh, I think that was a very poorly done documentary. Uh, in mixing up all kinds of of ideas about once saved, always saved, and blaming everything on on Calvinism when when uh, Calvinists refute a lot of the same things that they do. Um, uh, moving on down here, the question of whether or not I can know I'm saved, uh, I can know as as a Calvinist, I can know for sure that I'm going to heaven, but it's not based on me looking back on a profession of faith. It's not based on anything that I do. It's based, as I said, on the work of the Spirit within me. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So, how, But the question is, how do I know that? You know, am I looking back on something? Or is there something tangible or something that I can actually see and experience? Uh, and I have no argument with Tommy about imputed righteousness. No works that I do will be counted for anything good. They're all filthy rags. Uh, but the idea of repentance, uh, he brought up the idea of repentance, about repenting of sins. How do I know if I've repented uh, of enough sins? We repent of all our sins. In other words, if I have a bad thought, if I have a bad word that comes out of my mouth, I ought to be sensitive about sin. What we mean by repentance is that God, in the through the work of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit entering us, I mean, the, re remember, if you go to the Old Covenant, uh, where you had the presence of God within the tabernacle and in the temple, uh, that was a place that only the priest could go. It was a holy place. We are that now. The Holy Spirit has come inside of us. Now, what's he going to do? Well, sin has no place in us. Now, we're going to battle sin. Uh, as long as I'm in this body, as Tommy pointed out, I'm going to be constantly battling sin, and I'm going to be constantly losing. But when the scriptures tell me certain things, that you have the work of the Holy Spirit on the one side, you have the flesh that remains in us on the other side, how's that going to reveal itself to the world as a Christian? As a Christian, that's going to be revealed in my constant battle against sin, that I'm going to be constantly confessing my sins, because I'm always sinning. You know, the, uh, I don't know how many people have the idea that Calvinists think they're Pharisees. You know, that they, uh, we know how sinful we are. Our uh, worship services include a confession, a corporate confession of sin. That is, we together, we gather together to worship the Lord. We come as sinners confessing our sins to the Lord. It's a constant thing. It's not a one-time thing. It's not like I'm, I'm going back and saying, okay, I want to I want to get saved. I believe in Jesus. Now I need to repent of my sins. And I get out on the list, doom, 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 doom. Okay, I'm done. And now I go on. No, that's, <laughs> that's not how it works. Sin becomes the enemy and the constant uh, harasser of the Christian. So as the, the Christian has to deal with this, uh, it, there's this constant repentance. And there's a constant, as there, as there is a constant belief in Christ, constant faith in Christ, there is a constant repentance. So the, I hope that cleared things up a little bit. The idea of, I, I hesitate to bring this up, but the idea of Calvinists being Pharisees, I spent five years at First Baptist in Hammond. I spent many other years before that in other fundamentalist churches. So comparing the two, uh, I have a little experience in that. Now, whenever you have people getting up and pounding the pulpit and screaming about uh, don't go fornicating, but while the whole time they're out fornicating, that is, is hypocrisy. That is Phariseeism. Now that, uh, I'm not saying things like that don't happen in the reform faith and we have issues that we have to deal with people are disciplined but i've seen enough of it you know that the, the accusation of pharisee you know on, on to, to us it kind of uh it doesn't make me upset it almost makes me laugh because of what i've seen in the past uh let's see here um the definition of perseverance in that it's too vague 
I think Tommy pointed out. The idea of perseverance is simply this. The Holy Spirit being in me, uh, I am to utilize the means of grace that God gives me. I am to be under the preaching of the word. I am uh, to uh, observe the Lord's sacraments, the uh, baptism and, and the Lord's table. Uh, I uh, am to be involved in, in, my, in my own personal prayer and Bible reading, that these are the things that strengthen us. And because they're the commands of God and we do them, then we don't fall away. The, 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 and the idea of falling away here, you know, I, I watched that debate between Tommy and uh, I think it was his name, AK, uh, last week. And uh, I think there was something missing there. The idea that what exactly is falling away? Uh, uh, the other fellow said that you can lose your salvation. Yes, but but the scriptures talk a whole lot about that. But what it is, if the person has a false profession and the the books of the Bible, the New Testament are written to bodies of believers within these bodies of believers. You have the tares and the wheat that there's a warning. There, there could be somebody in that movement and or in that body of, a, of believers who is there. He's he's. Uh, curious he sees what's going on he he uh, has an interest in it but he's not quite there yet he may appear to be a christian but the holy spirit has not entered him yet he's not uh, been born again yet but he's there so the warnings in in hebrews are okay now that you're here don't turn back don't go back to your your judaism and sacrifices and so forth uh but remain with us abide with us stay uh in the assembly of this the saints listen to the word of god and that is what the perseverance is all about, because as we know, some are among us are tares. Now, we want them to be saved. The way that they get saved is that that they are under the word of God. The, the, the uh, faith cometh by preaching or by by uh, through, by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As they're under the preaching of the word, then the, then the, the Holy Spirit can work in that that preaching of the word and convert that heart. If they leave then that possibility leaves with them. So that's the, the reason for that and the, and the necessity of uh, perseverance. Uh, let's see here. And then I think we, uh, we have to be careful. I'm, I'm not sure exactly Tommy's position. You got 15 on seconds, Jeff. 15 seconds. Okay. Yeah. The idea of the spiritual birth, is it just the spirit and doesn't affect my body? We'll get into that a little bit later. I think that that's about all I had. Okay, Pastor Jeff, thank you very much for the eight-minute rebuttal. I know those uh, rebuttal rounds fly by with all the points to address. So, uh, pastors, we've concluded our opening statements and our rebuttals for tonight's debate. We're now entering everybody's favorite part of these events, the open discussion. And so, since Pastor Jeff just ended with his rebuttal, Pastor Tommy, why don't we allow you to lead the way for the first 20 minutes. And so we'll have you kick off the discussion. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about the, uh, the spiritual birth again. I, I, be I believe, and we talked about this a little bit in the debate with, uh, AK that when a person gets saved, that their spirit is regenerated, not their, not their body, Okay. Their spirit is regenerated. It's brought to life. I believe in first John, when it talks about that, which is born of God, sinneth not, that's that new man, the spiritual man. And so now we actually have what we need to get victory over sin. If we walk in the spirit, but we still have the flesh. And I think one of the most confusing things for a lot of people where they're confused is they think because I got saved, I'm not going to struggle with these sins anymore. And they're hearing a lot of the, this, I think, bad preaching on repentance. And they're like, man, did I really get it? I mean, I still am being tempted to, to look into lust. I, I still feel like going and getting a drink and, you know, and, and things like that. And so I guess I, I would ask you, you know, when that, uh, for, so if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. How do you define the new creature? I would define him as the spiritual man that he, that has become new. And I believe it has been made. It is complete. It's going to go on forever. But how would you define the new creature? Well, as, as Jesus pointed out to Nicodemus, that he's given a new heart. 
So the heart, if you define the heart for in a biblical way, the heart is the very center of the being. You now, so uh, if you have a new heart, you, your mind is being renewed. The Holy Spirit is there. Um, and I'm going, uh, what was your question again, Tommy? I'm sorry. So, yeah. So, I mean, what what is the new creature? Okay. The, the, the new creature uh, is a new person in Christ. I am a different. Uh, when I when I was at First Baptist in, in Hammond and youth conference as a teenager, we used to sing a song, the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The thing, places I used to go, I don't go there anymore and so forth. You know, so uh, we're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect, but we're set in a different direction. And that direction is now guided by the Holy Spirit. Now I can go, I have ups and downs. If I fail to uh, uh, utilize the means of grace, the word of God, hear the preaching of the word, go to church. Uh, if, I'm a, if I'm a true believer, then I'm going to struggle and I'm going to struggle greatly, uh, but I'm helped greatly by the helps that the with the, with the holy spirit in me that these things then will give me that strength to to continue on so then wouldn't you be saying that okay i became a new creature therefore yeah the things i used to do i don't do them anymore okay which that's reformation reformation's good so we've been made this new creature where we're not doing the things we used to do but we still do some things sometimes yeah and maybe we feel bad but then you would agree too when Jesus Christ returns and we're resurrected, he's going to have to make us new again. That is unlike the nature of Christ or the nature of God. When God makes something new, he makes it complete. He makes it, you know, he fixes it permanently. And I believe that the spiritual man that died inside us when we sin, when Paul said when, uh, when the commandment came, sin revived and I died, obviously didn't mean physically, but that spiritual man did. It happens to all of us. Every one of us are going to choose sin at some point like Adam did because we come from Adam. That spiritual man in us dies. But then when we believe on Christ, God regenerates that. And, you know, it, it will it will never die. It it has been made perfect. And so what we're all waiting for now, you know, we groan within ourselves waiting for that redemption of our bodies because now there's a part of us, the spirit, that wants to be like Christ, but this flesh does not still want to be like Christ. And the flesh, sometimes we allow it to have victory over the spirit. And I'm, I'm afraid that, you know, the way you are teaching, you know, it's, it's causing a lot of confusion for people. And I believe too, it's causing them to feel defeated because it's like, man, I just keep turning back to sin, but that's why we got to teach people how to walk in the spirit so they don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. And what you're saying makes it sound like, you know, I've got this new heart. Therefore, I'm not going to want to do the things I did before. No, the new heart is from the spiritual man. And so now you have something that doesn't want to do those things, but you better believe you still have something in you that wants to do all of those things. Well, we're promised overcoming power. Greater is he that is in you than is he, than he that is in the world. So that being the case, uh, it it affects more than just the inside of me. It's going to affect because it's my heart. It's going to affect the outside as well. You now, the, the, when you think about the idea of becoming holy, you know, it, it's not just at the resurrection. I think we're looking at two different categories. Uh, whenever the spirit comes in, he is currently working in a progressive way. And that's the only time I think the, the, the word I, I like the word progressive is is in this theological term. In a progressive way, he is he is making us more holy as we grow in Christ, as we grow in grace. So his presence then is going to be leading us in holiness, because without holiness, we can't see God. We're to pursue it. You know, we are to pursue peace and we're to pursue holiness. So there's an actual uh, work on our, our, our part in pursuing holiness, and that is through the Holy Spirit. And as he does this, uh, for us, we are progressively getting uh, more and more closer to being like Jesus Christ. Now, it's a very, very long way off, but he's there working. And whenever the resurrection of the body occurs, then it'll be complete. But until then, the Holy Spirit's not going to sit idly by. He's going to be working in us uh, to use us in, in whatever fashion he desires in this, this world. Well, I, yeah, and I would agree that what is in us is more powerful. We can have victory over the flesh. We absolutely can have victory, and, but and when we and when we don't, 
It's because we chose to go after the th after the things of the flesh. But I don't think that we're guaranteed that um that there will be a victorious result in our life. I mean, we're guaranteed victory if we walk in the spirit. But I don't think there's a guarantee that everyone who gets saved is going to be victorious. And when I say that too, I mean victorious in the sense that we're going to see a change that would make the religious leaders happy. Obviously, we will have victory when Jesus Christ returns and he changes our, our vile body. But in the meantime, uh, I, I think there's going to be many times where I'm going to be very unsatisfied with the progress that takes place in someone's life. And I, and I believe God is probably uh, unsatisfied with all of us. You know, I think all of us grieve the Holy Spirit from time to time. But at the end of the day, the resurrection is going to happen for a reason because God you know, can't compromise on his holiness. And so um, he's going to change every single one of us at his, as, at his return. And we're, uh, and then our body will then be like what we are on the inside in our spirit. But I, I, I think it's a stretch to just assume everyone is going to do good. I believe, um, in, in you know, without getting into this past, I don't know how you would interpret it, but the dog returning to its vomit and the sound of the wallow, I believe that's referring to save people. I think save people are capable of going back and just living in their carnal, filthy nature, and they become worthless for the cause of Christ. They don't produce, and they don't produce any fruit. Uh, what is the text there? Is that First Peter, Second Peter? I think it's Second Peter two, or Second Peter two or three. Dog returns to its vomit. I have that marked. I think. Um, I can. Yeah. Um, I have a way to find it. Yeah, it's Second Peter two, twenty one and twenty two. Uh, one more page. And I believe the way of righteousness. Um, it is, it's, it's a reference based on the context of everything that's been spoken of in second Peter. It's on how to live. We're um, in chapter one. It mentions according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And so I, I, we have, we have been called to godliness. It is, we have been, um, ordained unto good works. It is God's will for us to walk in those good works. And when a person gets saved, they don't, they're not just downloaded with, you know, how to live in every area of their life. We have to teach them. We have to, in the great commission, after we save them and get them saved and baptized, we have to teach them to observe all things. And so when someone learns the way of righteousness, and it's especially when they escape the pollutions of the world and just all the filth of that, they get out of it and then go back to it. That is a very shameful thing. And it's going to end badly for them on this earth. They will be severely punished. I believe. Well, chapter two of uh, second Peter is dealing with false teachers. Yes. And but it's all in that part. It's talking about the people that they are deceiving. The false teachers are getting, I believe believers to forsake the way of righteousness. You know, false teachers and Satan doesn't give up on people after they get saved. He probably works on them harder to keep them from getting more people saved. Yeah, I think this is one of those falling away verses for if they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse than the first. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having in order to turn from the holy commandment delivered them. See, this is where you get into like the Hebrews thing where you have a taste of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, like a person's in church. They they have they feel the workings of God in their heart. They're resisting that they get to a certain point and they turn away. And at that point of turning away where it says that that their condition is worse than it was at the beginning. So you know, I don't believe that we're talking about save people here uh, for one to turn return to the vomit of the world. In this way, I think is a revelation that that person, uh, I mean, as far as we can see, it would not be saved. Yeah, it, well, it's very strong language. But here's the thing about that, though. 
I mean, what sins would you say a believer is not capable of doing? Oh, a believer can commit any sin. Okay. And that's so, I mean, yes, but the, the question is, will they remain in that sin? And you go to, you go, you go to David, for example, uh, David committed murder and adultery. I mean, that's two big bad ones. Well, what happens to him? Mm -hmm. God doesn't, he doesn't let him remain a murderer and adulterer. He sends Nathan. Nathan comes, preaches to David. David writes Psalm 51. Oh, uh, I, I've sinned against God, uh, against thee and thee only have I sinned. So you see how that God works in work th with with his believers. He doesn't uh, allow the righteous to fall and remain down. He, he will bring them back up. Now, uh, one thing I would like to point out is I can't judge a person's salvation. If someone's in sin, I don't know what position they are in sin. I don't know if it's something permanent. Uh, but while they're in the sin, that's where church discipline is to be used. Uh, I don't know if they're going to come back or not. Only the Lord knows. But I'm commanded to view them as an unbeliever, as to view them as, as a tax collector or a heathen. And then to treat them as such and say, look, we do not consider you a Christian until you repent, turn from that. And then we receive them back in the church when they do. If they don't, then we remove them from the church rolls. Uh, I, I, if that ever happens, I've, I've had to deal with it a couple of times over my, in my ministry. I tell them, stay in the church. Listen to the word of God, but but we, we take you off the church roll. You can't come to the Lord's table because the way you're living now, we can't consider you a Christian. I, well, I would I agree. Know. Yeah. Well, and I but I, I would agree with what you said there. But you you know one of the big hostilities between our crowd and your crowd is it does you know people like yourself and, and you included often cast shade on those that we uh, get saved out soul winning, and it's always you know. Because, you know, you're not seeing the fruit and it does seem like it, one, it discourages soul winning. It might even discourage some who made a profession and maybe is, is struggling because it seems as though some, you know, somehow, you know, you've seen, you know, these people that we've won and what's going on. And it's like, you know, so it's like, what's the standard? What do I, need? I talked to one Calvinist fellow one time and he's like, he's like, well, I said, I said, what's the, like the bare minimum that somebody, cause he's like, they have to do something. And he, he told me, you know, they'll at least get in church, but then for how long, you know? Well, that's the, the whole idea. Once again, uh, one thing, I, I don't believe that salvation is a one-time thing. I think it's a lifetime. So when someone, uh, whenever you uh, go and, and give someone the gospel, which is a wonderful thing, you're telling them about Jesus Christ. Yes. And they may pray and, and, and they may uh, show a little evidence there while you're there. But the, the real test is, do they continue on? Do they go on from that point or not? And again, mm -hmm. only the Lord knows. There's, there's one person I know for sure that made a profession of faith, never did anything. And I know he's in heaven. And you probably know who he is, Tony. Tony. Yeah. The, the, the thief cross. on the cross. Mm -hmm. because, because Jesus said so. Other than that, if someone... Like I've had dozens of them too. You go and they seem so excited about, oh, yes, I'll, I'll come. So then you go to pick them up. They're not there. They're hiding. You know, they're gone. Well, what did it mean? Well, then uh, if a person has the Holy Spirit in them and they're transformed, they have a new heart. That heart's going to be hungry for the word. They're going to hunger after Jesus Christ. I need him. I must have him. I must have the word of God. So there's going to be at least that hunger there that we then can work with. And we're not going to have to drag him to church. There's going to be that transformation. And that's why I, I think about myself when I was saved. Uh, my mother had to drag me to church. You know, Easter Sunday, uh, 1978, I think it was. Uh, she, I, I, she, I told her I'd go to church with her, and then I changed my mind. And she forced me to go. You know, and so I went. I heard about the resurrection. And from that point on, I, I didn't have to be told to go to church. Now, I, not, it's not me. It's not anything within me. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the work of God in the heart, which gives us that hunger. You know, that, that uh, they're not need, if someone's alive, they're going to hunger after the, the sincere milk of the word. If they're dead, they're not going to be hungry. You know, so that's why, and, and I hesitate to count people, you know, or to give people assurance. You know, assurance will come through the preaching of the word. You know, as, as people are sitting in, in church, listening to the word, reading the word, the Holy Spirit does that, not me. You know, I hesitate very much to give anybody assurance. I'm, I might work with somebody to work them through something, 
but uh, I, I don't say you're, yeah, I think you're going to heaven. I, I don't tell them that. I let the Holy Spirit do that. So, yeah, and I have a problem with you saying, you know, there, there'll be a transformation. We won't have to drag them into church, but there's so many things we're not factoring in. For one, most churches today are an absolute joke. And many I agree, people I agree. Have, yeah, and many people have experienced those. So you might get somebody saved and then all of a sudden, but in their mind, they're like, well, I'm not going to church, man. That's crazy because they have the wrong idea about it. And that's why, again, we have to teach them. And, you know, when, again, it's, it's very, it seems very clear to me when you're talking about that, that new heart, okay, you, what you're saying is true, but again, I don't think you have the right definition of that. They have a spiritual heart now, but we have to teach people how to go after that. We've got to, you know, we've got to teach them scripture. We've got to show these things to them and it can be very difficult getting them in church so we can start doing these things and we might well, have here's to the thing mm -hmm. you, you mentioned about that with, and this goes along with the new heart the new covenant yes i must teach them the word i must uh, teach them verse by verse through the scriptures and allow the spirit to work on them but there's also something i can't teach them and that's what comes through the giving of the new heart it's where it says you won't need a teacher you know i think it was at ezekiel i think ezekiel or jeremiah says that that you don't they don't need to be taught uh, because the Lord will be their teacher within them. So there you have the inside, which is hungry, which is desiring that. And, and then you have the outside as the teacher. I'm to give them the word that they may grow, uh, that they may be protected I might, and, and pray for them. But I, I can't teach them within to have that desire. That's what God does. So that's that's what would, would be the difference there. Well, yeah, in Jeremiah, it says we won't have to teach them to know the Lord. You know, because under the old covenant, mm -hmm. many people who didn't know the Lord were in the old covenant. They got in through circumcision. But under the new covenant, we get in through faith in Christ. So all who are, we don't need to teach them to know the Lord, but we do have to teach them how to walk in the spirit. We do have to teach them the way of righteousness for sure. And, and, um, and, you know, you brought up David because, you know, David is a great example of someone who committed great sins. And of course, you know, rightfully he repented. But we also have King Saul, who I think you would I maybe would agree that he was saved. And I don't see where he ever I question it. I, I don't know. I question. Okay. It. But uh, yeah, so it, it would be my belief that he he was saved. Uh, he did go to heaven, but I don't believe we ever see him truly repent. You know, he was upset that he was going to lose the kingdom and all that, but he never truly repented. And uh, you know, I'm on uh, Sunday night. I'm preaching on First Corinthians 11. In verse 28, it says, but let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And I believe what he's teaching right there is exactly what we see in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26, where it says, if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. And then he goes on to say in verse 29 of how much sore punishment Suppose ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath accounted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and done despite the spirit of grace. I believe this is also referring to save, when saved people take advantage of the grace of God, they get punished and they can get punished severely. The wording in Hebrews 10 is very strong. Many people make it like you lose your salvation. No. He's saying, you're going to punish. The Lord will judge his people. And we have in Hebrews, talks about whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And in 1 Corinthians 11, after he can, calls him out for all these things, he says, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And he always talks about sleeping for uh, the dead in Christ, because uh, they're, yes, they're physically dead, but they're going to rise again one of these days. And I believe he's showing people here who were taking advantage of the grace of God. They weren't taking the things of God seriously, specifically the Lord's Supper that represents the body and the blood of Christ. And that is, that's a very severe sin that will come with the chastening hand of God. And, and so uh, I do, God's going to judge his children sometimes to the point of death, like he did with King Saul, like these people in first Corinthians chapter 11. And, uh, but at the same time, 
they never repented. They died in that sin. You mean Saul? Saul and that, these people in First Corinthians eleven. Yeah. Okay. That's that's why we don't know. I, I, all I can say is I don't know. But do you think you know, the people like, in First Corinthians eleven who were he said sleep? He said many sleep. Do you believe those, that's reference? Yeah. Say people being dead. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, I, I I just don't know their their spiritual condition. That's what I'm saying. When they died. I mean, were they saved or not? I don't know. That's, well, I, uh, I think the fact that he says sleep implies that they were saved. That, that could be. Yeah. I mean, I would agree. There are, there are severe punishments. I, 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 I refrain from using the word punishment because the punishment for sin was on Christ, but chastisement. God chastises mm -hmm. those. They're like Ananias and Sapphira. Do we, I, I mean, I'm, I think that they were saved. I don't know, you know, because there's tares of wheat within the church. Uh, so that, that being the case, um, you know, when you come to the Lord's table, especially, uh, you, you have, uh, I'm not, I'm forgetting the question. <laughs> if there was well, a question. Was, yeah. Actually, Pastor Tommy, mm -hmm. feel free to respond. We hit the 20 minute mark and then we'll continue as we're going free flowing and organic, but Jeff will allow you to more so lead the way now for the next 20 minutes. So Pastor Tommy, feel free to respond and then we'll let Pastor Jeff pick the next topic and lead the way. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, no, I, I believe what we're seeing there in 1 Corinthians 11 is exactly what we see in Hebrews chapter 10. God's going to judge his people. And I believe he often does even to the point of death because Christians are capable of great sins, which Calvinists would agree, but they're always pretty sure there's going to be repentance. I don't think, it, I don't think it's guaranteed. Now, I think if a person is in deep sin and they are never chastened, uh, then they're bastards and not sons. But I don't believe God has called us to judge that because we often can't see the chastening hand of God in someone's life. Yeah, and, and like I said, I don't know when uh, mm -hmm. or how long. Uh, I only see a portion of time. I don't see what's going to happen in the end. I don't see what led to that. So all I can do is see what was happening at the moment and act upon that as I see it, as the scriptures tell me to. Uh, so I, I do have some questions. Now, you did say that it's possible to have a false faith. Uh, by what standard, then, would a person determine the genuineness of their faith? If I wanted to, if I'm looking, and I've had to deal with this my whole ministry, dealing with people that don't know they're saved, how would you tell them that, or what, what would you tell them to do to try to get that assurance of their salvation? Yeah, so in, they need to have faith in the right thing. For example... Um, in first Corinthians 15, it talks about believing in vain and specifically he was uh, addressing people who, uh, they had a belief in Christ, but they denied the resurrection. So, um, I think many people, they have a faith in Christ. I think many people believe in the death, burial and resurrection of Christ, but they're not trusting in it for their salvation. And so, um, yeah, I, in, in our church too, and, and when we go soul winning, you know, we try to be very thorough because a lot of people say they're Christians and saved and all that. But we ask a lot of follow up questions to try to find out if it is a if it's a biblical faith or a genuine faith, for lack of a better term. So the way I would view that is I won't know that until they're proven, you know, that they have been through, as Peter says, through, through trials mm -hmm. or James talks about the trials of their faith. When they go through that, uh, they, they've been mocked, they've been persecuted. They suffer something financially or physically, a loss of some sort, and their faith is tried. Then they're gen. Now, I mean, like I, I don't know. You know, if a person is is there and they're and they're nodding their heads, yes, I agree with all of this. They may as well. They, they may well be saved, but I can't. I won't be able to tell that until I see the actual workings of God in their heart. I mean, not in their heart, but in what's coming out of them. And it might be false. You know, there's a lot of false. Uh, professors out there. So um, hypocrites, so we don't know. Right. But, uh, well, let's see. Here, and here's a question. Uh, 1 Peter 1.5 tells us that we are kept by the power of God through faith. If a person has made a profession of faith, but has turned from it, are they still being kept? Well, one thing that I always say in our church, everybody believes in perseverance of the saints to one extent or another. Um, and so to me, and where I distinguish, put a distinction between 
people like myself and a Calvinist is I believe the Calvinists focus on the works where I, fo I would focus on the profession. And I don't believe a person who believes on Christ for their salvation is going to like convert to Islam or something like that. I do believe they will um, maintain that belief. Cause again, the, uh, some of the crazy free gracers out there, one person in the Trinity, they don't like to talk about very much is the Holy spirit. And I don't, to me, convincing a saved person who has the Holy spirit and dwelling in them that, you know, they're not saved or whatever. Um, that would be like convincing me I'm not married when my wife lives with me. You know, you're, you're not going to convince me of that. So I think that's a, uh, a weird hypothetical that it's just not going to happen. Yeah, the, the reason I asked that, uh, I had it in my own family uh, growing up in the IFB movement. Uh, my mother was talking about a certain relative of mine, and she uh, was made a profession of faith as, as a young child and then just completely went into atheism. Mm -hmm. So my mother said, well, no matter whether you like it or not, you're still going to heaven. You know, and I, 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 if we're kept by the power of God through faith, faith is a gift of God from my, from my perspective, then that person is going to maintain a faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, if the person doesn't go to church and do that, I, I just can't, I can't say that they're saved. They may be. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of weak believers, but at the same time, I, I can't give them that assurance. So, well, yes, you're, you know, you said that made that profession of faith. So you know, you're definitely in. You know, where whereas I think that it's it's something greater than that. Um, no, I, I agree with you. I do believe they will maintain their faith in Jesus Christ. And and I do think that there are many people who, again, they've they've made false professions in the sense that they were believing the wrong thing. Some people I, I think this is a huge problem. I've, I saw this a lot when I was a youth director. Young people, they you know, they hear there's a lot of bad teaching in the Baptist world on repentance. And a lot of, uh, they, they don't do a good job teaching about the new man and the old man. And often young people, they'll, they'll preach. It's like, you know, you're still struggling with this sin. You've been looking at stuff on the internet. You've been talking back to your parents. You must not really be saved. And so then what they do is they go, they go to the altar trying to repent of their sins. And in their heart, they're like, man, I'm going to listen to mom and dad from now on. I'm never going to look at another woman with lust again. And, and in their heart, they are trying to repent of all their sins and it never lasts, you know? And so professing faith in the wrong thing is never going to last. It's never going to last. But I do believe true faith in Jesus Christ, you know, believing in the death, burial, and resurrection. Not, I, I don't believe repenting of sins will ever last for anybody. Uh, they, you're going to have to keep doing it. But real faith, I do believe it will last. The the um, idea of the repentance uh, with the young people, uh, I think that, uh, and I agree with you with a lot of these churches because we went, my wife and I went through it too. And there's a constant preaching about rock music back in our day, rock music, and if you wear your hair too long and you know, all that stuff, uh, and reading the wrong books or whatever. Uh, but usually it was attacking the wrong thing. You know, I, I don't I don't think that that you can be haranguing people about these things without first giving them what they need spiritually and in the word of God. If we're preaching the word of God and I, and uh, I mean, faithfully going through what the scriptures actually teach that they will then grow in grace and see that for themselves. You know, that's uh, I mean, and I go back 45 years, I think in the youth group, I can go and look back at my youth group and I can count on my, my hand out of maybe a hundred kids that might be still in, involved in church and, you know, and, and actually concerned about things of the Lord. So, you know, you see all that excitement, people knocking on doors with me and everything. And they went off cursing and, and blaspheming God, you know, later in life. You know, so what I think what was they focused so much on the outside, they missed the heart. They missed the scripture. The word of God is what washes us. You know, the, 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 the Holy Spirit and the word of God. Uh, he does that work and he's the one that cleanses us. He's the one that empowers us. And that only happens whenever you're teaching the word of God. You, you can't scare people you know, away from the movie theater, you know, or from, can I say excessive alcohol drinking and you know, drunkenness and, you know, other things. I listened to Roloff and he's preaching about smoking, you know, and I, well, I don't like smoking, but 
I, I don't have it in scripture, so I don't preach against smoking. You know, but but you, uh, let me let me go on here and uh, move to something different. Uh, let's see. I have a couple of things I wanted to. Um, in, in James 2, 19, it talks about the faith of demons. Uh, that the faith of demons is mentioned. How is that connected to a dead faith? Where he talks about a, a dead faith, and then he talks about the faith of demons in James chapter 2. Right. Well, in James 2, it just says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils believe and tremble. Um, just believing in one God doesn't mean you're saved. I mean, the Muslims believe in one God. And uh, even if demons believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you know, he didn't die for them. And the whole point of James 2 is, and this and this is important too, is man cannot see your faith without mm -hmm. your works. And so the whole point of James 2 is, you know, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus with respect to persons. That sends a bad message. You know, don't just tell somebody you have faith. Show them. Have some good works because we're trying to make a difference in people's life. And so, um, but here's the thing, you this I say this all the time. You can't show me your faith. I'm I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to mess this up. I usually have it written down. But like we just like we can't please God with our works. We please Him with our faith. It's opposite for me. I I have to have the works. Man has to have the works because I can't see your heart. Mm -hmm. I have a really good statement to when it comes to that, but I, I'm drawing a blank on it right now. Yeah. Well, I, I, the reason I'm referring to that is verse 17 says faith without works. that does not have works is dead. And then he goes on about the faith of the demons and the one God, I think when, whenever you, you look at that historically, most people of that time period will lead to many gods. Mm -hmm. So the one God is, Hey, that you're, you, you, you took a step in the right direction, but even the demons can do that. So I think what it's looking at here is that you can have a certain type of faith that is not going to save. You know, and that's the thing that concerns me. And what type of faith is that? It's a faith that doesn't produce some type of works that can be seen. Now, again, I don't know the heart. I can't make a, a definite pro proclamation. But I can, from what I see, say well, if, a, if a person does not have faith, their faith is no better than demons. Mm. You know, the, the people, the people that that uh, were of Jesus day were actually worse off than the demons where they had Christ right there with him, with them. They had tried to throw him off a cliff. And what do the demons do? The demons tremble in fear. So you can have a people that have worse faith than demons. So, so I, I, yeah, I had a conversation with the Calvinist one time and he brought up James two, And, and the way, this is the way he illustrated it. Um, he said in James two, we see Rahab. All she did was put out a scarlet, cord but then we see abraham who is willing to sacrifice his own son so we have a tiny little work but then we have one of the mm -hmm. greatest works so there will be some evidence but the whole point of james too it's about showing other people your faith and so how did the spies know about rahab she put that scarlet color so they were able to see her faith with that work abraham we know he was saved long before he offered up his son isaac but that was a great testimony to the whole world and to all believers on how to also live by faith. So James two, um, it is, a, it is a dead faith. If I, if you're hungry and need food and I just have faith, God's going to feed you, but I don't have any works. That faith that I have is going to be completely useless in getting your belly full. But when it comes to salvation, James two is not about salvation. My faith absolutely has works. It's just the works of Jesus Christ. Well, I know the verse 14 says, can that faith save him? You know, there's a lot save of from what? Well, faith, save him salvation. Or you know, hunger. That, that, uh, what does a prophet, or my nakedness? brother, someone says he has faith, but does not have works can, can actually, it should be, can that faith save him? That but type what's of the faith. need? Well, yeah, the, the, the evidence is, I'm what, going to I'm love my trying, love. trying to profit our brethren. I'm trying to profit my brother. Now I can't die for him. He can't put his faith in me. I can help him. I can clothe him. I can feed him. And so I can save him from those physical needs that he has. If I have works, 
So th this isn't about salvation. Well, no, about... when you look at it, though, I mean, well, let me say that your your interpretation is unique. Because when you go to the old dead guys you were talking about at the beginning, they, they would disagree with you. I mean, well, a lot of them. I, I, and I reject those old dead guys for a reason. Okay. But when, when, you, when you look at this where it says, uh, what does it profit, my brethren, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food? If you don't have love for your brother, then that's an evidence that that faith that, that you say that you have isn't genuine. Because he says if a man says he has faith and has not works, can that faith save him? So so you can go to 1 John and you look at 1 John and you see, well, one of the evidences of a, believing in Christ that I can look at, do I love the brethren? If I have a, a brother or sister who is hungry and I'm not feeding them, my faith is, is insufficient. There's something wrong. I don't have that compassion that should be there. Uh, that the Holy Spirit would give me for a brother or sister in Christ. So, uh, I mean, I have to disagree with you on the, the concept that's not including salvation in that. Right. Well, let, but, me, uh, let me, can I say, yeah, say one thing about that? So in Hebrews 11, it gives us all these examples of great works that were done through faith. And it wasn't just about salvation. You know, they stopped the mouth of lions. You know, they mm -hmm. uh, wonderful things happen as a result of their faith. With faith that produces something. There's always works, 100% of the time. Otherwise, it's nothing. But again, with salvation, the whole point of the work of salvation, it, Jesus does that. We have faith in his work, not our own work, but in everything else. If I want my neighbor to be fed, I'm not going to believe on the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to feed him. He didn't die on the cross to fill bellies. He died to save souls. So no, but he, he had to change lives, to change hearts. He, if, a, if someone has a new heart, they're going to have a different approach to a starving brother is what is being said. If you don't care about your starving brother, there's an evidence there that your faith that, that you say that you have isn't genuine. And that's why you go to the, the faith of the demons. You know, and that's why I wanted to try to get, get back to, you know, the assurance that I'm that I that I would give to somebody. I'm not not to, to give them, but uh, for them to examine themselves. How would they examine themselves? Would it be looking back on my profession or would it be something other than that that would be the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life? I mean, how would you deal with that? If a person is is just distraught and they don't know they're saved, well, how do I give how do I where do how do I point them in the right direction? Do I tell yeah. them, did you have faith in Christ 20 years ago? Or do I say, do you believe in Christ now? Do you, is there evidence in your heart now? that you have a hunger for the word of God. You have a hunger for the things of God. The Holy mm. Spirit's convicting you of sin. Are these things there? So what's the difference? I mean, that's what I'm trying to get at. Is it a profession-based assurance or is it something that's based on something greater than that? Yeah, If and I've talked to many people who were struggling with whether or not they were saved. I would never go to James 2 for that person. I That's just not what it's about. If someone, whenever somebody is struggling wondering wondering what if they're saved or not my I, I always find out about their profession how did you get saved what did you put your faith in what were you believing what happened and so then if it and then if they're saying all the right things then it just is a matter of well do you believe that or not and so obviously i'm going to go to romans 10 13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved do you not believe that do you did you call on the lord trusting in his righteousness to get you to heaven, believing he would give you that gift of eternal life and that you'd never lose it. D did you believe that? Why what don't if I you can't remember now? that, Tommy? What if I can't, what if I look back? I just can't remember if I was sincere. I have mm -hmm. no idea. What What do I do? I, I mean, I. Mm -hmm. it was 55 years ago that I did that. What do I do? I, yeah. I just can't remember. Yeah. So if somebody does not, doesn't remember, then I would, then I would ask him, do you believe it now? And, okay. you know, do you, and, and then I would say, you know, do you, so, or, and of course, when I say, do you believe it now, if they're struggling with their salvation, you know, I would add, you know, I would go through those things. It's like, now, do you believe this? You know, do you believe that maybe you don't remember what you did before, you know, but if, do you believe right now, I would just, I would have them call on the Lord right then, if, if that were the case. I uh, see with, with, uh, in our position, that calling on the name of the Lord, uh, that's not the means of salvation. Well, calling on the, on the name of the Lord is something 
uh, what, which happens initially, and then it continues on as we go to prayer, as we, we are to be, be praying without ceasing. We are the ones defined as the ones who call upon the name of the Lord. So that's how I would view that. That's what, what concerns me you know, with, with that viewpoint is that the profession gets, I think, too much attention. Whereas we should be saying, do you believe in Jesus Christ now? That's, I mean, what you said there, right. uh, that's what I, where I would start. What is your, not, not what you did before, what you believed before, but do you believe now? And, and then we go from there. Do you love Jesus Christ? If a person loves the Lord Jesus Christ, what's the scripture say? They're, oh, they're going yeah. to keep his commandments. Are you, are you seeking to not, not keeping them perfectly, but are you seeking to keep the commandments of the Lord? Or, yeah. So we, you know, yeah, so, there's no way I would I would question their works to give them assurance of salvation because I would have to lower the standard again. Um, but and, and I don't. But believe how do you know, Tommy? I mean, I mean, again, yes, I don't believe. I, Paul, I, believe in the imputed, I don't believe. I don't believe. I, I Paul believe in the, the imputed Lord. righteousness of Christ. Okay. Mm -hmm. I there's no works whatsoever. That's an abomination to God to think that any work could get me any favor with God would merit me anything before God. Right. But but then again, how how am I going to to tell them? That, yes, well, it's not, you know, don't look at your works. No, I mean, I say, look at what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. I I mean, I'm, I deal with, with a whole variety of people, some very mature people in the church and some very young Christians. And I have one fellow that struggles with sin all the time. And he, he admits it in front of the whole church, I, I'm struggling. We pray for him. You know, but do, do you love Jesus Christ? Are you struggling against sin? Mm. These, I believe, are the evidences. You know, and especially the struggling against sin. If sin is just something that, that you enjoy and, and you want to ride it through, whatever whatever Satan brings you, hey, come bring it on, Satan. I'm having a good time. If that's your attitude, I question it. You know, that that faith, that, that faith may be a, a mere profession of faith if they love sin. You know, it's one thing to fall into sin, but it's another thing to love it and pursue it, whereas we're told to pursue holiness. So uh, I think that might be the difference. I wanted to point one one more thing out here. Colossians uh, one twenty one. Philippians, Colossians. We want to turn there. Colossians. And then, uh, and, and gentlemen, the conversation's flowing greatly. I'm really enjoying this. Did we want to make this the last topic? And then we'll jump yes. into, okay. And yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, it's almost bedtime. Um, okay, it says, it's Colossians 121 through 23. And you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away, from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, am a minister. So the question would be, what the the word there continue? What was that? What would that mean to you to continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast? Yeah, it's Is that just. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, well, if you remember your debate last week, mm -hmm. that uh, is his name, A.K. Is that what they call? Yes. Him? AK, mm -hmm. Okay. He was constantly bringing this up about losing your salvation. OK, and I, I mean, I watched it and I, I agree with with you on that. Uh, but I also think that we were talking about the falling away of the false believer that's within the Colossian church. So you have that this great promise that's given in, you know, in verse 21. And then you have 23, it says, but it's if you continue in the faith. So what do you what does that mean if if. If um, I don't continue in the faith here, does that does that change my position uh, as far as my my status with, with God? I'm not. Well, I, that's a bad, badly worded one. Uh, how we view it would that change how we view if a person doesn't continue in this, well, in this passage? Right. It's a matter of being standing before God, unblameable and unreprovable in His sight. You know, I don't know what all is going to happen on Judgment Day, but there's going to be people who suffer loss, but they themselves will be saved. Yet so is by fire. Are many people's works are going to burn because they have not been faithful? They've not been fruitful. You know, they've given up on serving the Lord, and so um, you know, this is a, again. There's constant admonitions in the new testament for people to continue in the faith 
not mm -hmm. continue in the faith for salvation, you know, because, and you and I would agree, there's just nothing in the Bible to indicate that a believer can stop believing on Christ for salvation, but we absolutely can quit serving. And, and that, that happens all the time. And it's a shame when it does. Okay. I think, I think that's about okay. all that I would have then. Okay. Excellent discussion. Uh, time flew by. I think we were uh, comprehensive in the sense that we touched on all of the relevant issues and points brought up in openings and rebuttals. Gentlemen, we have some excellent audience questions. I'm excited to see how you both engage these. But before we do get into our audience questions, I want to give you both the opportunity to have a five-minute closing summary where you can wrap up your thoughts and your points for tonight's debate. So, Pastor Tommy, since you kicked us off with your opening statement, we'll give you the first closing. And so whenever you're ready, you got five minutes. Okay. Yeah, well, I definitely appreciate this opportunity and pre appreciate Pastor Dollar coming on here and doing this. Uh, I've been wanting to do something for a while to just show the clear distinction that I believe between perseverance of the saints. And I do. I believe that there is too much focus uh, on the individual. I do believe as Christians and as members of a church that you know we do need to examine people and sometimes we have to treat people as a heathen and publican and all we can do is judge by works because that's all we can see i can't see someone's faith somebody can listen to my preaching online and they can know exactly what they are supposed to say from hearing from hearing me preach but it doesn't mean they actually believe it and so sometimes we have to put people out and treat them as heathens and publicans but i think but i'm mainly wanting to talk about this too be, for the individuals that are out there too many people are struggling with whether or not they are saved. And I believe it is because of much teaching from Calvinists. And even, I would say, a lot of non-Calvinist Baptists do the same thing, where they're always uh, causing people to doubt their salvation because they are still struggling with sin. Our flesh will always struggle with sin. My flesh will always love sin. My flesh will always enjoy sin. Now, it will grieve my spirit when I sin and it will grieve the Holy spirit of God. And I do believe God will punish me and he will remind me that I am his. But, but at the end of the day, uh, those desires are going to always going to be there. And it was a great day when, for me, when I learned, uh, that it is, it's, the, um, my body is not saved yet. My body is promised salvation my flesh is promised salvation but it does not have it yet my soul is saved i will be saved because i have this regenerated spirit that is in me and so i have eternal life but i am waiting for the redemption of my body i am a son of god right now but it does not yet appear what i shall be god is going to have to change every one of us and he will change us and he will change us completely just like he did to that dead spirit that was inside us. He resurrected it. He revived it. And it is without sin. Uh, and it is, it is like Christ. It always agrees with the Holy Spirit. It always agrees with the word of God. But in my flesh dwells no good thing. And, and God does give us, um, you know, he does give us free will. It's not uh, God's will for us to sin but we often do. And when we do, uh, you know, we grieve the Holy spirit. Uh, we get ourselves in trouble. We get ourselves some chastening, but, um, we must help believers understand this truth. And I believe if we do it, it will give them assurance in their salvation. And then ultimately what it will do too, when they sin, it will do exactly what sin should do. It will cause them to be ashamed of themselves. And because of the fact they didn't have to do that, what is inside us is stronger it is more powerful and if we'll walk in that spirit we will we will have victory but a lot of people are just uh, I, I must i must not have really got it and no no you just you're you have no discipline you're giving your flesh everything at once just stop doing it don't joke just making constant professions thinking that all those desires are going away it's always going to be there and so we need to keep the focus on Jesus Christ. He is the just 
and he is he is the justifier. And so, um, but yeah, so I hope that uh, you know those of you out there listening, if you've never put your faith and trust completely in Christ, believe in what He did for you, and just trust in that. And uh, when you see some of these free gracers out there, say, giving lip service, I mean, and saying a lot of things that I would agree with in the gospel, but they behave like foaming at the mouth lunatics. You know what? Don't fellowship with them. Don't treat them like don't you know you don't have to necessarily call them unsaved, but there are some saved people that we shouldn't have fellowship with because of their bad behavior, and do that so they will be ashamed. They don't need to keep acting like that. They they have the spirit of God, and it's God's will for them to walk in the newness of life and to do the uh, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and have the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And so let's shame those people who are given the right gospel, maybe they're saved. Maybe they're just, maybe they're making the the gospel look bad. I, I don't know, but either way, what I don't ever want to do with a crazy free grace crowd is cast them into hell based on their doctrine, because I believe their doctrine is good. What I will do, I will cast them out of my fellowship because of their wicked behavior. And I believe that's biblical. And what I'm not going to do is change the gospel to distance myself from them. And I think I, I'm afraid too many people trying to get away from those crazy free gracers are going into lordship salvation and teaching a lot of repent of sins, Calvinism. And I think those take away all victory. And I don't I don't see how you can have assurance of salvation if we're looking at our works. And so that's all I have. OK, Tommy McMurtry, thank you very much for that five minute closing statement, Jeff. We're going to hand it over to you. And you also have five minutes for a closing statement. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think we need to go back to once again, that though I, I am of a spirit and my spirit's renewed, I'm also a body. And God doesn't just work with the spirit in this life. He also works with the body through sanctification. And there will be some tangible things whenever this occurs. You're going to be able to see it. Uh, you're, you're going to experience it. I don't experience God's election. We can argue all day about election. You know, we don't see it. We can't go back and, and view it. Uh, we have the record of the death of Christ, but we don't really experience it. We experience the work of the Spirit. He comes. Jesus ascended up into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he is very, very active. And he, he does things that, that in the spirit, spiritual realm are miraculous. And, and that he brings dead people to life. He brings those who are dead in their trespasses and sins to life through the preaching of the word and in his work, that, that is what occurs. So it's more than, than just a spiritual thing. It includes the body as well. Uh, whenever we have justification, we're always going to have sanctification with it. They're not the same. You can't, uh, it's confuses. Rome confuses the two. You know, Rome will, will tell you certain things to do, and that will help you be justified. Uh, but uh, the Protestant world looks at justification and then sanctification. But if you have one, you're going to have the other. And that sanctification is the work of the new heart where the spirit comes in and God is then empowering an actual events in your life, actual thoughts. You know, they're, they're, these are things that are going to happen to the believer. We have a, an entire book that was written for us to go through. To, if we have doubts about our salvation, am I really saved or not? Read the book of First John. I read it multiple times. I read the book of John. That was written for the same thing, the same reason. There's a reason why people give away the Gospels of, of John. But in, that, in the, those books, it tells you this is what a Christian looks like, and this is what a Christian doesn't look like. How can I tell? Well, I look and see. This is what the Bible talks about a Christian. I'm loving the Lord. I love the word of God. I struggle with sin. I'm not, I, I, I'm not free from sin, but I'm struggling with sin. If, if that is happening in my life and I, and I hate it and I'm, I'm battling against it, Romans chapter 7 is telling us about that. Well, that's an evidence there. Uh, uh, and then you, you can look on the other side as well. If the Bible says certain things about certain people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God, and I'm looking and, say, and saying, oh, well, I fit in that category. That should cause you to concern. And what do I do? You flee to the word of God. Uh, you go to the church. 
You know, people talk about you don't need the church. Well, yes, you do. You definitely need the church. The body of believers is something that is necessity for the Christian. You flee to the church. You pray, Lord, help me. Help my unbelief, Lord. And allow then the work of, of, of the Lord to, to, uh, to be, or get, put yourself under the work of the Lord that he may do the things that are necessary for you to have that transformed life. You know, I, I can't change my heart, but I can put myself in the position that my heart could be changed. I can go to a Bible preaching church where the word of God is being preached. I can listen and I can pray, Lord, help my unbelief. I, I can read the word of God and all, all of those things. And when it does happen, there's going to be some something tangible that you're going to to uh, to recognize. It's going to be there. It's not just going to be looking back on on something that occurred in the past or did I, was I sincere in the past? I remember doing that. As, and I know what Tommy's talking about. You know, that you, you get an evangelist come in and everybody gets saved again. I was saved uh, two times. I was baptized two times in an, an IFB church because I went home and I did something wrong and I felt I can't be saved. Went and got saved again. That's not what we're talking about. But you need to be under the, the word to hear and to grow in grace and there'll be something tangible. There is a danger of falling away, not losing your salvation. But in any church, there's tares and wheat. Do not do not think that you can just leave the church, leave the word of God and say, well, I'll be fine. I don't need the church. No, no, you you uh, you'll find yourself in a position and one day you might wake up and say, you know, I don't believe this stuff anymore. That's because the Holy Spirit may have been working in your life at one point where he says uh, uh, today is the day of salvation. Now, d don't don't reject this. Don't ignore this. And you did. And you walked away. Well, that's the case. You've fallen away. You may have made some profession of faith or connected yourself to a church. Uh, you didn't lose your salvation. You just never had it. So there, there will be tangible evidences. And uh, those evidences are brought, brought about uh, by the Spirit of God through the new birth. And I think that's about all that I'd have to say then. <clears throat> okay, Jeff, thank you very much for your uh, five-minute concluding statement. I appreciate it. Uh, gentlemen, excellent debate on this important topic. Uh, very edifying, I think. And now we got some great audience questions, too, with some uh, relevant passages to interact with. And so what we'll do, I think the best way to approach the audience question is how we usually do. Let's say the questions for you, Pastor Jeff, will allow you to respond. Then we'll give uh, Pastor Tommy the opportunity to respond or add anything. Then we give you the last word. So whoever the question's for gets the last word. Okay, here we go. First question comes in from Nakia. Looks like it's a question for both, though. So, Jeff, you just ended with your concluding statement. So, Tommy, we'll start with you. Luke 9.62. Then Jesus declared, no one who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. How does this, or how does it not apply to this de uh, debate? Uh, I mean, I believe that verse means exactly what it says. Um, if I'm going to be, that's why I need Jesus to make me fit for the kingdom of God, because uh, in my works, I definitely am not. So, um, yeah, I totally agree with that statement it means exactly what it says okay thank you tommy jeff any thoughts uh yeah i mean i, I would agree with that that um you, you have uh the context you have a fellow that wants to go and bid farewell to those that are at my house and jesus said to him no one having put his hand to the plow is fit looking back so uh yeah um i mean you have to take up your cross there's the the idea and and when you have that that command to go and to, and to come to the Lord Jesus, you need to to act on that immediately. Be willing to turn away from anything that gets in the way, and if not, then you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. It was a question for the both of you, so for those ones, we'll just do one response each. Okay, so the next one is an exegetical passage. Well, I guess the other one was too. This time, let's start with you, Jeff, since uh, Tommy started with the previous one. So how do we best understand this verse in light of each position being represented tonight? So Michelle, Cherie, appreciate it. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, 
they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. Pastor Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that just summarizes pretty much what I was saying during the whole time. And if you read the entire passage of Romans 8, uh, you, you find uh, that you, you have this great work that I talked about in, in my opening, that it's not just that Jesus loves you and, and, and you're saved now. It's that God the Father has done a work uh, in, in election. God the Son has done the work in redemption. God the Spirit then is doing this work. And then him being discussed here, that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So the, those who have the presence of the Spirit, are work, the Spirit is leading them. He's convicting them in sin, of sin, of righteousness, that I'm not doing what I should do, and of judgment. There's a judgment to come. All of these things are now, uh, we think of eternity. We should, eternity should always be on our mind. If that being the case, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And those people then that are led by the Spirit then are give evidence that they are the Son of God. And, and the thing mostly is for myself. You know, I, I can't look at others because you don't know the motivations of the heart. But for myself, if I'm looking there, okay, if I'm being led by the Spirit of God, that's an evidence that I'm a son of God. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your response. Tommy, go ahead. Yeah, I wish I had time to prove this because I know Jeff's probably not going to agree with what I'm going to say on this. But I preached a sermon on, on Romans 8 where I think I made a very clear case that what it means to walk in the spirit, more importantly, what it means to walk in the flesh, walking in the walking after the flesh, I guess it, not walking in the flesh, walking after the flesh. What it specifically is, is trying to obtain salvation through the things of the law. I, and that's very provable, especially if you go back to chapter seven, you look at what was being addressed. And so walking after the spirit, that's those who are trusting in Christ for salvation. So those who are led of the spirit of God are those who have looked to the things of Christ and what he did for salvation. And they are the sons of God versus those who are going after the things of the flesh or the law, the circumcision. They are not the sons of God. So, um, yeah, I I think that's an important thing. Most people think walking after the flesh is like walking in the flesh, meaning I'm giving my flesh what it wants rather than what the spirit wants. But that's not what Romans 8 is talking about. Okay, thank you uh, to the both of you for your responses. Okay, we got another one for both from Bruce. Question for both. So this time, Pastor Tommy, will start with you. $10 Super Chat, appreciate the support. Is the new covenant a unilateral agreement or bilateral agreement? Would God make man responsible to maintain his side of the covenant when man fails every time? Yeah, no, that's what the law was. So the new covenant is bilateral, but I guess it's between God and Jesus Christ. And that's why we must be in Christ. And if we believe on Christ, then we're secure in that covenant. Because And so a covenant has to be between at least two people. Well, the, the new covenant is it's, it's something that uh, God made with Christ. And so we, we get in through him. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, the new covenant, as we explained earlier, is something of God. You know that the old covenant you had, the old covenant functioned much much like the visible church, where you had with you had some saved within the children of Israel. Most probably were not. You know, uh, Elijah was told he had seven thousand that didn't bow, bow the, the knee to Baal out of the whole nation. You know, so, but in the new covenant, whenever God enacts the new covenant through our Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done then that is something which is a definitive thing that he does it. And he then gives us the power to uh, fulfill the, the obligations of the covenant, which, which he tells us then is that we are to be holy. We're holy through Christ, through initially through Christ, and then through sanctification, we're being made holy. So he does all of this. It's all a work of God. It's not of man, but he's the one that fulfills that in the new covenant. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Next one comes in from Chris Stevens, $10 Super Chat. Appreciate the support for tonight's debate. Another question for both. So this time, uh, Jeff, we'll start with you. <laughs> Do habitual, unrepentant 
cussing Christians have eternal life? Well, I think you need to, to uh, define cussing for one thing. Uh, I, I work with construction fellows and I'm constantly hearing words, which I wouldn't repeat here. Uh, but there's also a type of cussing, which is blasphemy, which is taking God's name in vain. So a person might have a language problem and they may not see a problem with it. Maybe they're not taught. You know, I don't know. Uh, certain words, you know, that's just part of their culture. But whenever they begin treading on the name of Christ, taking God's name in vain, that's when I wonder. Now, again, I don't know the heart. You know, they uh, if habitually they're, they're blaspheming God. God says those that take my name in vain are his enemies. That being the case, I can only look at the scripture and say, hey, if that's the case, well, then I would say probably not that this fellow has eternal life. Thank you, Jeff. Tommy, floor is yours. I hope not. No, I'm just kidding. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you can replace that with any sin. And, you know, again, God's going to deal with you if you are sinning. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I agree. We have the Holy Spirit. He should, he's going to grieve you when you're doing things are wrong. Even lost people. And um, one time in our old building, I, I uh, had some uh, people involved in a business that I was in. And they needed to meet with me about some stuff. I had to do some training. And so we, we ended up doing it at the church. We were down in the basement, showing them some different things. And uh, one of them accidentally, and these guys were not religious, made no claim to salvation at all. And one of the guys like saw a picture that I showed of this horrible house. And he was, and he like accidentally let out a cuss word and you, and they all like panicked, you know, because it bothered these lost guys cussing in a church. in a church. And so imagine a saved person with the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, cussing and never feeling bad about it. Again, we slip, you know, people slip up, they mess up. Um, but so I'm not going to think they're saved if I'm seeing that kind of behavior. But at the same time, uh, how many cuss words until, you know, the blood of Christ will cover the cussing. But uh, if you are going to take advantage of the grace of God and just continually do something that you know is wrong, God's going to bring the hammer down on you hard. So I, uh, but I, I'm not going to assume I know how soon God's going to do it, how he's going to deal with you. So I don't, I don't know if that helps or not, but I would doubt their salvation, but they're not going to stand before me on judgment day. Okay, gentlemen, appreciate the responses. Next one comes in, $2 super chat. Thank you very much. The A.W. Pink Panther. Question for both. Please read Romans 7, 18. Two Romans 8, verse 1, I'm assuming here, and exegete. So, okay, uh, Pastor Jeff, let's start with you. What are your thoughts overall on Romans 7 and moving into Romans 8? And then we'll uh, do the same for Pastor Tommy. How much time do we have? Yeah, I think rather than read it all, maybe I think as it applies to this debate, some people interpret Romans seven as a pre-converted Paul. Others say it's a converted Paul, you know, so maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. You guys understand. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, I think I preached the whole sermon on this little section here. Uh, for I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells for to me to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. Uh, I'm reading the New King James. If that, if you want to read the King James, Tommy, you're, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, for the the good which I I will I will to do I I uh, do not do, but the the evil that I will not to do that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil was present with me. Uh, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law, law of God, according to the inward man. Now, just stopping right there, uh, that point right there is showing that this is a saved man, that if he delights in the law of God. Uh, but I see another law in my members, so we still have to deal with the sins of the flesh, uh, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I think 
you have a situation in that section that is is uh, dealing with the reality of the new man and dealing with the remnants of the flesh. I delight in the law of God. Uh, I battle with sin. This is this is what I mentioned earlier, that this is evidence of the Christian life. The Christian life is not where a person gets up and says how good they are. It's they recognize the very thoughts of our mind are blasphemy to God. The prayers that I pray are failures many times. So even the very good things that I do are fa- and I battle with these things. While I'm praying, I may have an evil thought. So this is what Paul is dealing with here. But the fact that he delights in the law of God, that shows that he's a Christian. In 8.1, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we, we have the idea of walking in verse 1. This is where I would disagree with Tommy perhaps on this. To walk according to the flesh. And the, the idea is that there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There is a difference. Walking according to the flesh includes false religion, includes trying to justify yourself by works, but it also includes all the sins of the flesh uh, that are dealt with in other portions of scripture. You know, the, the sins of the flesh of fornication, of drunkenness, of, of lying, of extortion, and all these things where people are said they're not going to, ha- not, not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So when when you have when you have that, you have those walking in the spirit are the ones being led by the spirit who are the sons of God. No condemnation walking in the flesh, uh, according to the flesh. Uh, They're the ones who are condemned. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Jeff, for that response. Pastor Tommy, floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, well, this is good. This will give me a little bit of a chance to prove my point about chapter eight. So in verse one, he said, know ye not, brethren, before I speak unto them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over man as long as he liveth. And so when he gets to verse 18, what he's doing is he's showing how we cannot be righteous by the things of the law, by because of our flesh. So he said, when he said, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good things. Keeping the laws, what we do with our flesh, things like the circumcision and you know the the dietary restrictions and all these different things. That's all stuff we do in the flesh. We sin with our flesh. We are not righteous in our flesh. There's no good thing in our flesh. For the will is present with me, and how to perform that which is good in this flesh by the law, I find not. I cannot live up to the law. For the good that I would. I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. There's that spiritual man I've been talking about. That spiritual man, he loves the word of God. He loves the law of God. He loves the same things that God loves. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So if you're trying to keep the law, is you're just never going to succeed because the law is, our, is all stuff that we do in our flesh. And Paul did not like his sinful flesh. The spiritual man does not like that sinful flesh. And he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? That's that creation and groaning waiting for the redemption of our bodies. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. And so in chapter eight, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh. If you are walking after the flesh, you are condemned by the law. Why? Because you sin in your flesh and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have, instead of seeking after their good works and the things of the law and are walking after the spirit, no condemnation for them. So uh, hopefully that helps understand a little bit more about what I was saying from chapter eight as well. Gentlemen, appreciate the detailed responses to a a great question here on some great passages. 
Okay, next question comes in from ST Sizzle. $20 super chat, appreciate the support. This time, it, another question for both. So uh, Pastor Tommy, we'll start with you this time. Let's go through the question. Salvation was an Old Testament promise to the Jews. If the law, including the last three feast days, atonement, judgment, resurrection, are not yet fulfilled, how is anyone already saved? Are both covenants still in force? Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Was it for me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So when it comes to all those ones, uh, those feasts that are mentioned, those are ones that picture the return of Christ. And so right now we're saved. Right now we are the sons of God, but we are wait, we are also waiting for our salvation. We have the uh, we have, uh, from the fall of man, salvation has been available. It was available by promise. When Jesus Christ came 2000 years ago and he died on the cross, he made provision for salvation. And so, uh, all those who believe in him, uh, they, they're saved, but we are waiting for the possession of that salvation. And that will come at the resurrection when we will be completely made new no sin whatsoever. And all of those things are going to take place at the resurrection. So what the, uh, the, uh, uh, feast of atonement and judgment resurrection, what all those things pictured, we have all of the, those things have all been fulfilled spiritually, but they have not been fulfilled yet physically. And so, um, we are still waiting for those. So it is completely appropriate for us to say we are saved, we are the sons of God, but it's also appropriate too to say we're going to be saved. We're waiting for our, we're waiting for our salvation. Uh, we're waiting for the full package. So hopefully that helps. Yes, thank you, Tommy. Jeff, the floor is yours. Go ahead. I would agree with that. Uh, you go to Matthew five seventeen and eighteen. I do not think that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law to all is fulfilled. The old covenant law, uh, the civil law was, and, and the ceremonial laws were all completely fulfilled. There's, there's nothing we're waiting for in that. Uh, Christ came to fulfill them. So they're completely fulfilled. I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but I, I'm satisfied with Tommy's answer on that. Okay, thank you. I think it's, also based on eschatology. I know ST Sizzle is a full. Yeah, I, I'm an all millennial, so I don't uh, get into, get into <laughs> no all that. Okay. That helps me a little more knowing that he's a full preterist. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. but, uh, I, I would not agree with that. I'm a partial preter preterist mm -hmm. on millennials. Yeah. Tom, you I, gotta... I, that's a whole different ballgame. Yes, it is. The world of eschatology. Okay. Uh, all right. So next question here. Let's see. The AW, it's another question for both. So this is good. Well, most questions have just been for the both of you, not really anyone specific. So the AW Pink Panther, $5 super chat. Appreciate it. Don't you see how sad it is that we focus on drinking, smoking, when you guys are just as sinful inwardly? He points to Matthew 5, 27 to 30, being the passages where Jesus talks about if your right hand offend thee, pluck it out. Um, yeah, so I, I guess we, we can get our thoughts on maybe that verse, uh, Matthew 5, 27 to 30. And I think, Tommy, you started with the previous one. So, uh, Jeff, let's start with you now. Well, that deals uh, with the idea of looking at a woman with lust in your heart. And I think I, we pretty much covered that. Uh, the idea of smoking and drinking, uh, I don't believe that drinking one drink or so is a sin. I, I just, not because I do it, I don't drink at all. But looking at the scriptures, you know, where you look at, at, at the, the water and the wine issue and the Old Testament uh, talked about the, some of the liquor. I don't, I don't think that one drink is a sin. Drunkenness we know is a sin. The Bible's clear on that. Smoking, on the other hand, is not mentioned. I personally, I, I grew up in a smoker's home. I hated it. Uh, I suffered through it. And I, I can't stand it, but I won't preach against it because it's not something I find in the scripture. So again, uh, 
I'm not sure what what as far as it's directed at, at something that I said against it or you know because I, I I don't uh, I don't recall doing that. Thank you very much, Jeff. Tommy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I'm not acting sinless. That's why I don't believe we should judge people's salvations based on their works. Because yeah, it's there are certain sins that are super obvious and super easy to pick on, and so we use those things. But again. God doesn't lower his standard. So yeah, I, you know, pride matters, you know, just, uh, you know, thinking bad thoughts, I mean, you name it, sin is sin. So I'm not trying to act like I don't have any sin. I'm just saying, um, all sins matter and let's not judge, you know, ba or let, again, let's not cause an individual to doubt their salvation based on their works. Let's keep them focused on Christ because uh, that's where that's what the Bible does. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. All right. Next question here comes in from the book warden. Another question for both Tommy. We'll start with you this time. If once saved, always saved applies to all aspects of salvation, then why do the scriptures tell us we shall be judged according to our works for rewards? So, uh, yeah, we're going to, I believe we're going, uh, I'm a premillennialist. I believe we're going to do something, uh, in God's kingdom. And, um, but even if you don't believe in, uh, a literal millennium, I'm, I think everybody believes in rewards. So we're going to be judged according to the things done in our body. And we're going to see if there's any, uh, precious stone or if it's all going to be wood, hay and stubble that burns up. So it's, it, that's about rewards. That's not about whether we go into heaven or hell. Appreciate it. Pastor Jeff, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. When, whenever you're, you're dealing with a person who is a Christian versus a, I mean, there's a whole different, different ball game. You know, when you're judged according to your works, it says, I think as Tommy said, uh, there is a uh, rewards time of rewards and so forth. Uh, but, but the other, if it's, if it's a matter of salvation, that's for the great white throne, you know, that that's where the unsaved will go. So we have a whole, whole different thing here. Um, when it comes to judgment. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. So next question here is another exegetical question, James Frazier. And so how do we understand in light of our positions tonight, perseverance of the saints and once saved, always saved? He says, those who endure to the end shall be saved, specifically Matthew 24, 13. I understand it's in Mark as well, Mark 13. And so, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Pastor Jeff, let's start with you on this one. Okay. Well, whenever you go through that, I think it's, once again, I'm, I'm viewing as, as an all millennialist that uh, we're talking primarily about the struggles that are coming with the destruction of the temple. Uh, Judaism is going to lose its place in the world. The, uh, there's going to be great uh, sorrow and suffering. There's going to be a lot of persecution as well. The, the disciples are going to suffer great persecution. Uh, so uh, looking at the passage, um, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking that under the trials of persecution that, that we find here, that there is hope given to those. All the disciples are going to die, but one. All are going to suffer a martyr's death. So I think the idea is that those who endure through that to the end will be saved. And all of them did. All of, all of the 12 disciples that were being addressed did. Now those, uh, we have examples in history. And uh, the, the whole way through Christian history, you have examples of people who didn't. People who, who went uh, to a certain point and they denied the faith for the sake of saving their life. You know, that's a case just like Peter did. Peter was an example of that. Some of them are restored and some are not. Uh, but they, those who are restored will be the ones uh, that would, would be saved. Once again, we can't see the heart. So I think that's just a general way to look at it. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Pastor Tommy, floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I think no matter what your eschatology is, it's very clear that this is, you know, he's talking about great tribulation, you know, wars, famines, pestilence, armies. These are all physically dangerous, harmful things that can literally take your 
physical life. And he says in verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So um, that's not about salvation of the soul, but that's about surviving a time of great tribulation. And if I was in a fire, uh, I would hope that a fireman would save me from fire. He's not going to say he can't save my soul. That's already done. Okay, thank you, uh, Tommy and Jeff. His next question that comes in, interesting one. Short and sweet, church phone, 1611. What about King Solomon? A little more context. I think it's in First Kings, possibly. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. It talks about how he fell into the worshiping of uh, false gods, many, many concubines, wives. So some would say he was very backslidden. And so at the end of the day, was King Solomon uh, saved? And I guess, Jeff, you started with the previous one. So Tommy, let's have you start with this one. Yeah, well, I, I definitely think Solomon was saved. Um, but, and, and again, he also, I think he repented. I think Ecclesiastes um, was written later in his life personally. Uh, but um, I, I definitely think Solomon was saved and he did some pretty bad stuff for sure. Okay. Thank you, Tommy. Jeff, go ahead. I would say the same thing. I mean, that he came to the conclusion that the, uh, the uh, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. This is after experiencing all of those things, all the wealth he had, all the women, all the other things he experimented with. He found that uh, the duty of man is to fear God. So, once again, we don't know the heart, but I'm assuming, I mean, I would assume he was saved after reading that. Okay, very good. And we've got our last question. I think this will be a short and sweet one to answer. <laughs> the AW Pink Panther, $2 Super Chat. Do you both believe in justification by faith alone? Jeff, let's start with you. Oh, yes, definitely. By all means, that uh, there's not anything that man can bring to the table at all. Uh, that uh, that would justify him before God. So uh, that that is, I think, a, a given. Uh, that's part of the Reformation. That's what was was battled uh, for in the Reformation. Rome said, "Yes, you're justified by faith, but you must also have works." Uh, the reformers said, "No, it's works. Uh, it's it's faith alone. Uh, the works is, and this is part of the Reformation as well. the The idea is that that yes, works are important." They come after salvation, but they have nothing to do with meriting salvation. So, uh, yes, I believe in salvation or justification by faith alone. I'm made right in the sight of God through faith alone. Thank you very much, Pastor Jeff. Pastor Tommy, over to you. Yes, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. I absolutely justification by by faith alone. We can't we can't earn it, and. Um, and, you know, one thing, too, that was mentioned before where I think there was a misunderstanding, um, you know, what Jesus did on the cross. And I forgot the word Pastor Dollar used um, but when I talked about calling on the Lord for salvation. Um, my call is not the means of salvation. It is everything Jesus did. That is the, that is the means of salvation. And so I receive it when I believe uh, when I believe on him and when that person believes the gospel and, and they call on the Lord, they can be assured right then that they are saved because, yeah, the means is the body of Jesus. All right. Very good, pastors. We've reached the end of our Q&A and debate. And we've had a lot of good engagement from the chat. Here's uh, some Real solid appreciation here for tonight's debate. Michael Laren, appreciate the uh, super chat and support. This has been really good. I think this has been a really uh, fantastic debate on uh, perseverance of the saints and once saved, always saved. I think this needs to be engaged uh, more often. And we had two solid representations of both sides. And, and that's why we do this. So the audience can see uh, arguments put forth and interacted with from, from two sides rather than it being an echo chamber. So, okay, pastors, why don't we get some final words, final thoughts again? Thanks so much for your time. At least on my end, time has uh, really flown by. I've enjoyed this. Pastor Tommy, why don't we start with you again? Thanks so much for doing this. And any final words, final thoughts for tonight? 
Yeah, no, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I love talking about once saved, always saved. And uh, I like putting the distinction out there. I think we made a clear distinction. And it looks like a lot of Calvinists got to hear it. It's 60 40 uh, with our side on the poll I see there. And so I appreciate Pastor Dollar being a good sport. And uh, we have, we've thrown a lot of grenades at each other over the years. And so um, it's, it's kind of fun to, do the public debate with them. And uh, when I originally said something to him about doing it, he's like, I don't you know, not if it's going to be a bunch of name calling and stuff, man, I've never done anything like that. Pa Pastor Dollar is always associating me and holding me guilty for other people uh, who are, have similar beliefs to me. And uh, look at and his so, videos. What's that? Look at his videos. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm mean to Calvinists for sure. But again, in this type of format, I, I am, I'm always polite when it comes to these things. When I get behind a pulpit, I'm, I'm preaching, you know, when I'm doing a podcast, I'm, I'm, I'm letting it rip. And, uh, but, uh, I've never in a debate setting acted like a maniac. And so I think he's holding me accountable for other people that I remind him of. <laughs> well, it, it sounds like the grenade throwing has culminated with an epic salvation showdown in the debate octagon. So that's what we like to do here is professional civil and passionate. Nothing wrong with uh, our guests being adamant and, and confident and aggressive at times. Yes, there is a poll in the uh, chat for those who want to participate. Uh, just click what your specific view is, and that will uh, fully calculate when this is over. And so, okay, lots of uh, excellent feedback from our chat. As I said earlier, good solid mix of views tonight, which makes it more fun. Pastor Jeff, Thank you uh, for being here. Again, this was your first time here. I hope you had a, a good experience. And so is there any final thoughts, final words from you? Uh, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. It's it's nice to be able to, to talk to Tommy across from the Thanksgiving table, you know, and instead of uh, videos back and forth. Uh, but I did want to try to to make sure that people understood specifically. And I know it's not not Tommy so much. But there's a lot of anti-Calvinistic videos that are, that are just, just flood YouTube. And a lot of it is, is, is uh, straw men. And I wanted to make sure that people understood the idea of works. Perseverance does not have anything to do with human effort without the work of God. God is the initiator of all of it. So I just wanted to make sure that was plain and clear. And uh, as far as having a debate like this, I think we would need to almost have other versions of once saved, always saved, because there are different versions of that. Uh, like, like I said, like the old, uh, old school fundamentalism, I disagree with Tommy on some things. So yeah, that, but overall, I'm glad we were able to do it. I agree. Thank you very much. Uh, pastor Jeff for the final words, final thoughts. And also for those who have, uh, participated in the live chat, including the poll and also just sending in questions, feedback. I really enjoyed that audience Q&A. I think it really added to the debate as we got to engage some important and oftentimes controversial passages. So, okay, Pastor Jeff, Pastor Tommy, again, thanks so much for doing this. To the audience, thanks for uh, tuning in. Share this around. This kind of content is important as it gets us out of our theological echo chambers, puts us into the debate octagon, as I like to call it, and engage these important issues in a professional manner. Okay, Jeff, Tommy, and to the audience, we are uh, wrapping it up. God bless all. Good night. <laughs>